and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, everyone? And welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Patterson, Michael Remus with you for the next couple hours. And we have an absolutely packed show. Huge game tonight for the Winnipeg Jets as they finish up this West Coast road trip to take on the San Jose Sharks. Might want to mix a nap in, folks, because the puck will not drop until 9.30 p.m. tonight. And I know you're going to want to stay up for that one. Um, We will get into a couple of significant line changes with uh, coming out of practice yesterday, heading into the game in just a minute, and hear a little bit from head coach Rick Bonus from San Jose. We're also going to welcome in Dave Poulin and get his thoughts on the latest with the Winnipeg Jets and the playoff races in the National Hockey League. And I'll ask Dave on uh, what can be done to help a struggling power play that has been very, very productive in the past. Uh, We'll also have Mike McIntyre jump on and get his thoughts back from the road with the Winnipeg Jets before the game tonight. Brady Oliveira and Willie Jefferson won the uh, Ed Cottawich Good Guy Community Awards yesterday for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. It's been a minute since we've talked to Brady. He's going to jump on later on. And I cannot wait for this. The Boss of Bass, the first ever Canadian winner of the Bassmaster Classic, our pal Jeff Gustafson, is on his way back to Kenora from Jack- from Tennessee. We will catch up with him on the road and talk about his incredible victory on the weekend that everyone around these parts has been talking about just before we bring in michael remus a huge thanks to the sponsors that make this show happen every day princess auto um cool bet canada little brown jug canadian club whiskey culligan water vita health fresh market wallace and wallace consolidated supply f apparel manitoba battery the nick and nicky dq group boston pizza royal sports and we'll certainly get to a why not question of the day for our friends at Not Auto Corp, Overlit, Waverly, and McGilvery. Michael Remus, what is going on? This is going to be a hell of a fun show. Yeah, I see T. Will and Chet says these 9 p.m. start times are brutal, right? Well, good thing it's not 9.30. It's at 9 o'clock. It's at 9.30 start time tonight. So I'm looking forward, forward to that. I'm super fired up tonight, staying up late here, little hockey. Did we not um, do? Uh, did we not do a why not question today last week about how people feel about the late starts going into Anaheim? What was the uh, what was the final yeah, vote on said, that? I think the early votes the early votes were yes, they like nine p.m. starts. Uh, then it evened out and said no, people don't like them. I'm looking forward because I play hockey Tuesday night, so once I get off the ice, I'll be able to get home and catch the start of the game. So it actually works out great for well, me. Well, you like it too because evening. you get the big TV for these games. You don't get relegated yes. back to the office or an iPad or um, you know one of the kids' rooms or something like that. You get the big boy chair and the big boy TV tonight. You're 100% right. Yeah, my wife goes to bed early. I'm like, hey, I'm going to be watching the game. I get to uh, I get control of the remote, and I think it's great. So I love the late start times. There are some good other a uh, number of games on this evening around the NHL, and there were some good games last night. Some impacting the Jets' playoff, uh, you know, playoff standings. And uh, well, you know, look, you get to watch early games, have dinner, and then you settle in for a nice nine thirty start, and then stay up even later watch uh, Kenny and Randy in a legal curve post game. Yeah, K and R and I see after dark tonight. <laughs> uh, you may have to check in on those, but that's the beauty of YouTube and podcast, folks. If you fall asleep. It'll be there waiting for you when you wake up in the morning. Um, That being said, I'm sure many of us will be in those chat rooms with the fellas after the game. Um, We are going to get to the Jets room, but the chat is completely distracted 
from uh, everyone's just talking about your haircut today. Podcast listeners are really missing out. This is where the beauty of the YouTube broadcast really comes in when Remo gets his hair done like that. Just uh, just a showstopper of a uh, of a look today, Reem. Yeah, well, we're on YouTube. I got to look nice. Got a haircut this morning. Shout out to uh, Ken who uh, t- took care of me and. I'm here. I don't know. Can't wear a hat every day. Got to keep, you know, got to give people a reason to tune in here and say hi. Well, it's and- good too, especially <laughs> considering the ric- ridiculous way you would normally wear your hat. I'm, I'm fully, fully on board with the haircut, the look today. I'm going to need to do the same thing. Actually, we've got a very special new sponsor coming on next week. Speaking of haircuts, we'll look forward to introducing you oh, to right. them coming up next week. Um, but listen, we got Pooley coming up, Jeff Gustafson, Mike McIntyre, Brady. It's a very, very busy show. Um, but, Remo, right off the bat, before we talk to Pooley, let's get into these uh, lines for the Winnipeg Jets. And we sort of hit this very briefly yesterday at the end of the program because of the time change. But when things went out for uh, for practice yesterday, there was a change. <clears throat> it wasn't on the Connor Dubois Niederreiter line, but it was on that number. Well, if you want to call it the number two line, Shifley Wheeler and Ehlers are no longer. Nikolai Ehlers is playing with Lowry and Appleton, and Vladimir Nemetsnikov is playing with Shifley and Wheeler. And I did see a lot of people online, uh, you know, in my mentions and whatnot, talking about how Nick Ehlers was de- demoted. I've got a very different take on this, and I'm not sure what people think in the chat. To me, this is a promotion to the second line for Nikolai Ehlers. And I know that probably sounds insane, thinking about, you know, Mark Shifley's 38 goals and obviously Blake Wheeler's 50 points. I don't know how you could think any differently watching this team play for the last couple of weeks. The Adam Lowry line has been the line that has been working, producing, scoring, have been so impactful in all of these games. And frankly, it's been Adam Lowry's goals in the Nashville game, the Arizona game, and the Anaheim game that were maybe the biggest factors in the Jets winning those games. <clears throat> Nothing's happening right now for the Shafley wheeler pairing. I do think that they'll get a more defensively responsible player in Nemetsnikov to come in and maybe a guy that'll do a bit better of a job and winning some battles and maybe getting those guys those pucks. But from my perspective, Ehlers was being wasted on that line over the last couple of games. And I think Nick Ehlers is the one guy that has been shooting the puck. He certainly has been skating. He scored a couple of big goals, but he'll also get the puck on net for guys like Adam Lowry and Mason Appleton to bang in rebounds. Those are guys that have heeded the words of the coach. They have been in the blue paint. That is where they've done their work. Um, And I'll tell you what, having a little bit of size and some puck possession line mates to go with Nikolai Ehlers, I know it's a little uh, non-traditional to make a move like that. But honestly, I think this is a great move going into this game tonight. I think this makes that line far more offensively potent with Ehlers on it. And... To be perfectly honest, I mean, any any change to what's happening with the 55 line right now would be a positive because um, they have not been doing anything offensively. And more often than not, like last game, another minus two pulling the puck out of their own net. Yeah, it hasn't been going too hot uh, for Mark Shifley, you know, Blake Wheeler, Kyle Connor the last couple of games. Uh, and so, you know, Nikolai Ehlers, he had played well and uh, so did Adam Lowry. So put them together and... And we talked about this yesterday, how Nikolai Ehlers, when he's, you know, when he's playing with Larry Appleton, he's going to be the guy on that line. They want him carrying the puck through the neutral zone. He's not going to be able to defer to Mark Shifley or Kyle Connor if he's on their line. He's going to be the guy, and they're going to need him to, you know, do the zone entries, uh, skate around, maybe go around the net, look for Lowry or Appleton open in front and make something happen. And Bonus was asked, why are you switching up these lines? What's the goal? He's trying to get more offense uh, from them, and... You know, we'll have to keep it. One thing we're going to monitor is minutes. Who's getting the top minutes tonight? We think it's, uh, you know, Marat's got the lines here listed. But, I you know, you ask anyone here, I think the Connor dubois Niederreiter line will probably get the most minutes. And then is it going to be Ehlers, Lowry, Appleton, and third, Shafley, Nemestikov, Wheeler? Based on how they've played lately, um, we can make that argument. So that's something we're going to watch. And also the power player. They're going to get a power play goal. And I think, you know, if you want to say keys to the game... My key to the game going in, Hus, don't allow a goal within the first five minutes. Uh, that would be a win because that has been happening 
way too often. You put yourself at a tough spot. And they are playing a San Jose squad who did beat the Jets, um, what, it was a week ago? Two weeks ago? Uh, my, my tie sense of time is all messed half, up. I think, or two weeks. Yeah, of course, that was the um, yeah. the, the goal with 10 seconds left and then the uh, the loss in OT. Um, by the way, perfect time for a why not question of the day for not Autocorp. Hit us up in the chat. Are you, are you with me? with my theory that this is, in fact, a promotion for Nikolai Ehlers um, and makes it make sense. Um, and I'll tell you what, I know people are saying Nemestikov's not a first-line player. Well, guess what? He's not on the first line, right, folks. Um, and, you know, if this was two months ago, obviously things would be different, but we're living in the present right now with what's happening as of late with the Winnipeg Jets. And it's going to be Connor and Dubois leading the way offensively with ice time. And, and and I really think that how things shake out between the Shifley line and the Lowry line tonight, Remo, as far as time on ice, will really depend on the game score. I mean, if the Winnipeg Jets are in a spot where they are winning the game, um, I'm sure Rick Bonus will do everything he can to try and put Shifley and Wheeler out in situations that they can maybe get a little bit of a spark and have some good things happen offensively for them. But if this game is tight... Uh, if this game is going right down to uh, down to the wire in the third period and for some like a tie game, I think we'll probably see more Adam Lowry along with Nikolai Ehlers and uh, Mason Appleton. Regardless, I think the numbers are going to be relatively close. And you know, again, I can make a take that this is the second line. Um, the bottom line is, I think we know what the first line is right now, and it's the one with Pierre Luc Dubois and Kyle Connor on it. And uh, you know, <clears throat> very different lines going in different directions right now. But I think those two units will um, probably play more or less based on how they're playing. And I've got a hell of a lot more confidence that they'll get consistent shifts and efforts from the Lowry line than what we've got from the other unit. Yeah, I think so. And I think uh, scoring goals is going to be, you know, the key here, you know, getting to three, usually they win and they haven't been able to do that, uh, you know, too much lately. You know, we're talking about uh, the lineup are we going to see in the opposing net? I haven't really seen today, not confirmed yet, but is James Reimer going to be in net? Because he was pretty damn good here against the Jets last time. Maybe it'll be a different story here in San Jose tonight, and we're assuming uh, Connor Hellebuck. They're just going to they're going to keep riding, uh, riding him. Yeah, yeah, it's helly time until further notice right now, probably until the Winnipeg Jets clinch a playoff spot. And again, two days between last this game and the Kings game, Another two days between the San Jose game and the Friday game against Detroit at home. Uh, Rick Bonus spoke about that last week and was uh, was not, I don't think, too worried uh, about the workload of his goaltender going into April, considering the way the schedule looked. And, uh, you know, as well, a number of two-day breaks in the month of April uh, going on. Let's hear what Bones had to say. Um, this is uh, post-practice yesterday. When uh, Bones was asked, I believe Murata Tesh was there and Ken was there asking uh, Bones about uh, the swap of Nemetsnikov and Ehlers with the lines from practice heading into tonight's game. Simple as that. Yeah, more offense. Simple as that. Um, you know, the Doobie line has looked good together. We try. I've always thought we Vladdy would be a good fit with Mark and Neil, so I want to, I, we we got to look at that. Uh, maybe uh, Nick can help. You know, with Adam scoring, so maybe they can help Nick get going. Two big, strong guys that hang on to the puck. So it's as simple as that. We're just trying to find more offense. All right, there's uh, there's Bones, and you know he. Um... At times over the last week or so, he has seemed, um, I don't know what it is, exasperated, at times without answers, at times biting his tongue, maybe from saying something that he would regret. Um, but you see a guy right there that very simply saying, this team needs to score more goals. They need to find a way of generating more. And uh, this is a change that I think most people would agree makes sense right now just because of what hasn't been happening for the line when you had Ehlers, Shifley, and Wheeler on it. And if you are if you have an opportunity to get more of one of those players, I think you do it and hope that maybe on the other side, um, that other line with Wheeler and Shifley can sort of snap out of it maybe with a new look and a new player on their wing and Nemestikov who can do a lot of things in both ends that, frankly, I don't think any of the players when Ehlers was on that line was capable of doing.
Nah, he muted there. Um, yeah, and Ehlers, we'll see what his ice time is um, on that third line there with Lowry and Appleton. You know, it's funny. You, Murad has him here listed on the... Line two. What'd you say? As, yeah, I'm saying the third it's line, line but I think they're at... Yeah, you're saying it's line two, and the Wheeler line is the third line. So, um, I don't know. I, got, I don't I got think no there's any doubt what... I, I don't think there's any doubt what line Rick Bonus trusts more right now. Yeah, I would uh, I would ag agree with that. Sorry, I'm rattled. I muted myself, and uh, it's always the, it's always the clip. So uh, I was gonna say, you know, people are asking in chat, is this a must win? I think it's more of a can't lose than a must win. <laughs> has, uh, you're playing the San Jose Sharks here at the bottom of the standings. Uh, there's the Jets. You know, look at the money puck playoff odds, seventy seven point three percent. So I think this is a can't lose. Yeah, I, I I'm with you on that. Can't must win. Nah, can't lose. Definitely. Shout out to Dennis Bernstein for giving us that amazing saying that I think is going to have a lot of legs here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Here's a little bit more from Bones. Um, talking about Nemetsnikov and why he's thought he could be a fit with Mark Scheifele and Blake Wheeler. It's his hockey IQ. He hangs on the plays. He knows where people are. He can find people. And he doesn't throw the puck away. Right? That's the biggest thing. He hangs on to it. When you're playing with those two guys and you want to be a puck possession team, the third guy in the line can't be getting it and throwing it away. Vladi will get it and he'll hang on to it. He'll buy time for them to support him. You played with Kucherov, so if you can play with skilled guys, you would know that better than anyone because you saw it. Yeah. How big a factor is that? Um, it's a uh, fact that he played with Kuch, no. I mean, that's, you know, you think about those things, but the biggest thing is, okay, who can we put with those two guys who has the offensive hockey IQ, who has the puck skills, who has the resiliency to hang on to the puck until he can make a play. Glad he fits that bill. So there's uh, Bones with a little bit of his thought process in uh, moving to Metznikov in with Shifley and Wheeler. And I couldn't help but here maybe a little bit of dissatisfaction with Ehlers in that line based on you know giving the puck away and uh, that has been an issue I mean as much as Ehlers has been far more productive than those other players as of late has done a better job of getting shots on net and generating offense there has been I mean just that puck management and puck control and not giving the puck away has been an issue um, but here's what Bones had to say about Ehlers in his situation with the line change going into tonight against San Jose. Nikolai, could he play? Does he have to adjust to more of a straight line game when he plays? No, with I want him skating with the puck. I don't want him changing whatsoever. I, after him every day, get the puck and skate, get the puck and skate. He didn't skate with it last game. He didn't. And we need him to get the puck and skate with it. So Adam and, and Apple, went. we'll see how it goes, but they'll give him some size that should clear out some space for him to give him a little more room with the puck. But I, I, from day one, we want Nick getting the puck and skating with it. That's when he's at his best. He, he just got it a couple times the other night. He wasn't moving, and he gave the puck away. So we got to try something else. All right, so there's uh, there's Bones with his thoughts on uh, Ehlers, the line changes, and his squad going into tonight's game. Uh, we'll have more on this. We'll kind of break it down with Mike McIntyre when he joins us a little bit later on in the program. Uh, we are going to talk with Dave Poulin right off the bat about the latest with the Winnipeg Jets. Now, just before we bring in Pooley, got to give a shout-out to our pal Donnie and the gang down at Manitoba Battery. Folks, if you need a battery for your car, your truck, or even that summer toy that you're working on right now as we wait for spring to finally arrive, Manitoba Battery wants you to know they're the most convenient and well-priced option in the city. You can put an order in for your battery at lunchtime today or held to start a Winnipeg sports talk and have it sitting on your doorstep in two to four hours for less money than you'd spend anywhere else in Winnipeg on the same battery. It's that simple. No more waiting for a parking spot at Costco or waiting in a line at Canadian Tire and spending your money at a big box store for a battery. That's right. You can shop local, get the best price in town, and have the convenience of have it delivered to you by Manitoba Battery. Give them a call at 783-8787, or you can order online at manitobabattery.com. Let Manitoba Battery simplify your life and the buying process while you can support local. And you can always pop down and see Donnie and his great staff in person at 1026 Logan Avenue. While we wait for the snow to melt, 
Joe, Spicy, and the gang at Consolidated Supply are ready to go for both golf season and spring. They are the irrigation and artificial turf leaders, not just in the golf industry, but for regular folks like us that might want to do a project on their property. Um, if you do need irrigation uh, solutions, or options talk to them about that and heck if you've got any need for artificial turf like maybe a dream putting green in your backyard they can certainly hook you up with that as well and speaking of the backyard maybe take a look at some beautiful spa and hot tub options or maybe a wonderful outdoor kitchen they've got plenty of options on that as well what you really should do is pop down and see them at 1395 niaqua road east or check out them out online for everything that they can do for you and your upcoming projects online at their newly revamped website at cte.ca. Uh, March is coming to an end, folks. Don't forget, still got a couple days to get your nominations in for our Unsung Hero Community Hero with Wallace and Wallace. Send us an email to unsunghero at winnipegsportstalk.com. Let us know about that person in your life or community that's helping others through long hours of volunteering or charity work or maybe just being that person that in addition to a busy life of their own is always there to help out neighbors in need. Send us that email, unsunghero at winnipegsportstalk.com. The unsung hero for the month will get a jersey, Jets jersey, autographed by all-star defenseman Josh Morrissey. Wallace and Wallace will also make a $500 donation in the name of the WST listener that nominated the unsung hero. And even better yet, Josh and Margot Morrissey will match that as well. Big thanks to Wallace and Wallace for their great support of the Unsung Hero Program and Winnipeg Sports Talk. And just before we get to Pooley, hey gang, if you're looking for great prices on natural and organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries, you need to stop by one of seven Vita Health Fresh Market stores or online at myvita.ca. A great local company, family owned and operated since 1936, Vita Health also carries Winnipeg's largest assortment of local products too and with spring just around the corner get ready for it with ultimate male energy formulated specifically for men over 35 ultimate male energy is designed to help improve testosterone production reduce excess body fat build muscle tissue maintain prostate health and more and it's on sale today at vita health vita health fresh market empowering people to lead healthy lives seven winnipeg locations including the newest store in linden ridge and you can check them out online as well at myvita.ca all right mike mcintyre still to come brady Oliveira still to come bass master champion jeff gustafson still to come but right now let's catch up with tsn hockey analyst dave poolin pooley how are you great to have you back on winnipeg sports talk Always good to join you, Andrew. And I'm in Philadelphia today. I have Montreal here tonight. So back in my old stomping grounds. And always good to come back. There amidst a little bit of change here, as you might have heard. Um, we'll get a chance, actually, to chat with Danny Breer tonight on air. He's going to join Brian Mudrick for a chat uh, between one of the intermissions. So that'll be interesting to hear. But just a lot of change, a team that's in transition. And by the way, he's playing pretty well right now. They're 4 0 and 1 in their last five. And Montreal is playing pretty well right now, too. So it should be a fun night. Well, speaking of change, I think, uh, you know, the more we get towards the end of the finish line of this 82 game regular season with the Winnipeg Jets, more change is expected in the offseason. But in the, in the present right now, Dave, what do you make of uh, where the Jets are heading into this game tonight against the Sharks, their lead over uh, the uh, Calgary Flames and Nashville, um, as well as kind of what you've seen from the Jets over the last couple of weeks with some important wins, but uh, not necessarily the most confidence-inspiring ways of getting it done. Well, a couple of different things. Let's, let's start with the here and now. Um, the ultimate is that you're in control, and you absolutely control what happens. The schedule, you, you, you're, tonight, you're in San Jose, and then you come home for five. So if you were going to say... At the start of the year, with eight, you know, with eight left, you've you're going to play, you know, one of the lower tier teams in the league on the road. Then you're coming home for five games, and those five games largely will decide what happens because there's a Calgary and Nashville game in there. So, I think you take those odds, and you'd say, okay, now step two, going into the playoffs, you've got to be playing better. I mean, we just absolutely have to be playing better. And that's what I would be saying in the locker room right now. 
you don't want to backdoor it into the playoffs and you know have a casual appearance and go home in in two weeks you want to go into the playoffs on a nice little roll being the confident team and by the way it's the same group that was very confident and rolling through the early part of the year to you know well past the halfway point of the year so where has that gone and how do you re-trigger that and i think that's what it comes down to and it does come down to individuals and you know i think everyone knew coming into the year that the coaches had an enormous challenge that a challenge with the way the team had performed that a challenge with some individuals and maybe we didn't give the coaching staff enough credit early in the year for how effectively they were able to change the makeup and the structure of what was going on and the on ice product which was very effective through that portion of the season so that team is still there somewhere and and i believe the coaches did their job initially in finding that team and now it's up to the players to refine both themselves and collectively as a group that team yeah you know you uh, you make a great point um you know and kevin chevalier said at the beginning of the season i mean this was a seismic change with rick bonus coming in it was hard to argue i mean when this team this team was in first place in the western conference on the 17th mm-hmm. of january just over two months ago um are we just seeing regression to the mean? Is this old habits of a team that's done this, had disappointing second halves before coming out, Dave? Or any theories on... Because what you said is exactly true. If you told me at the start of the season the Jets would be in control of their own destiny with eight games left coming up for a homestand, I'd say, fantastic. If you told me that was going to be the case when they're first place in the middle of January, I would say, what the hell's happening for the next couple months? It's... Uh, it's very confusing, I think, to a lot of fans as to how we got here, considering what you just mentioned about the first half plus of the season. Well, there could have been a few derailers along the way, certainly injuries at key points, and you don't get to have the same lineup. and You lose a guy like Nikolai Ehlers for a good part of the year, and, and then you inject players back into the lineup. But that being said, I don't think it's regression of the mean to where they are now i'd say it's regression up to the mean to where they were in january i mean i I think a lot of people have believed in this team over the last couple of years and thought that there was more there than than the team was rewarding it you know its group with and so you know i mean it's you clearly have one of the best goaltenders in the league and you know the group of forwards the group of the top six forwards should be an elite group and have been on many occasions. And now healthy again, the play the pieces fall into place and you know, and and Adam Lowry can certainly anchor one of the best third lines in the game. So as people have gotten healthy and Mason Appleton gets healthy, um, it should be more effective, not less effective. And then you start going past the actual play and say, okay, well, what is it then? Is it up to individual guys? And you really have to challenge each other right now if i'm in that locker room you've got to challenge each other and say there's more here than we've shown lately well speaking of challenges to uh to the locker room in particular players i mean rick bonus has had some of the a couple of the most interesting availabilities we've seen in his time with the winnipeg jets um and really dave this goes back to the carolina game a couple of weeks ago where mark shifley blake wheeler uh, nito niederreiter were sat down for 12 minutes in the second period and Mark didn't want to talk about it afterwards and, you know, did speak to it to an extent a couple days later, but still was seemingly not very cool with that. And it ended up being Neil, you know, Niedermeyer, excuse me, it was Kyle Connor along with Shifley and Niederreiter that were, uh, that were sat down. Um, it really did seem like that was Rick Bonus playing one of the final cards to try and do exactly what you had said, get his team back playing the way that they're going to need to play every player um, going into the playoffs. And, Unfortunately, what we're seeing right now is maybe the worst case scenario. I think you can safely say that this player has not reacted positively to that right now. And it's a big issue. You mentioned Adam Lowry, <clears throat> excuse me, being the third line. Nikolai Ehlers has been moved off Shifley's line to Adam Lowry. And considering what we've seen in the last week, I'm not sure this isn't a promotion. Um, your number one center is so important. Uh, maybe your number one player outside of your goaltender, Dave. Um I'm just interested in your perspective on this challenge for Rick Bonus and the team um, and what, if anything, they can do to try and get a guy that is so important to their success back on the right track when they need him most. 
Well, the, the, the last line that you said, get the player back on the track. Um, he's the one who made the track. He's the one who set his own bar. It's not someone else that said, here's how good we think you can be. He's played that well. He's the one who, who showed that he can he's be got one 38 top, goals. I know he can be one of the top centers in the league. So he's the one who set his own bar. And, and once again, everything about that bar is real and he's got to get back to it. It's up to him to get back to it. And there's, it's almost flattering in a way, you know, I, I would look at it as this person thinks so much of me and thinks I'm so important that they're willing to go to these extremes to get me to where I have to be. And, you know, I, I think as a player, you have to realize that's someone trying to help you or get you angry because they think you perform better angry or get you mad at them and then play better, whatever it is. It is a tool, an avenue that it, 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 you've got to be careful with how you use it. But when you use it, you're using it to get the player back to where they have to be. And if I'm the player, I want to get back to where I have to be. And if that's what it takes to get me back there and I have to play angry and I have to play mad, so be it, as long as I'm playing. The bottom line is how he plays, how he performs, and how effective he is in helping this hockey team win hockey games. And so I think that's where you've arrived at. It's not comfortable, but this game isn't always supposed to be comfortable, Andrew. It's not. And there's times when, when it was very uncomfortable to be a player. There was times for me when it was very uncomfortable to be a coach or a manager. And comfort isn't something that goes hand in hand with playing at the highest level all the time. And right now it's uncomfortable, but you rip through the next seven or eight games, it could be very comfortable going into the playoffs for Winnipeg. Well, the one thing that hasn't been comfortable is their um, hold on a playoff spot over the course of this last six weeks, as we've talked about. And, you know, I think we were all looking to see who was going to step up. Josh Morrissey's been that guy all year long. Obviously, Connor Hellebuck. I mean, the top forwards are having a very difficult time. And, mm -hmm. you know, for all the talk about Adam Lowry and how the scoring touch just completely um, evaporated on that third line, Dave, this is a guy that has come up big when his team needed it the most. Three massive goals in the Nashville game, the Arizona game, and the uh, and the um, Ducks game. Um, of games that Winnipeg absolutely have to have. And you look back, I mean, Adam Lowry's goals have basically been key, key moments in the only wins this team's had as of late, and that's what's keeping them above the line. I'm smiling because I'm thinking of the underage player I saw in junior, we were there to watch someone else, and I'm looking at this underage, and he still had to wear the full face cage because he was only he was a double underage. Thinking, okay, I really like this kid. Who's this kid? And then Winnipeg jumped up and took him in the third round that year. We talked about him so much. So I've watched Adam for a long time, and always respect his plan. Quite frankly, I'm surprised he hasn't scored more. That he hasn't become a regular 20 goal scorer in the National Hockey League. That's how much I think of his play. And he's accepted a role, but he's also if you talk about stepping out of his comfort zone, it would be into what he's done from a leadership standpoint and to score those critical goals. Cause that doesn't come as naturally to him, the scoring side of it as it does to a Mark Shifley. And, you know, I'm still a believer in this team that this team can get on, on track. And we watched it, as you said, through the middle of January, get on track and perform and do what they have to do. They know they're going to get the stop at the key time. They know their defense is fully capable. And it, it, if I'm going to put it up to one group, and I'm going to say which is the group that should be most capable of handling it with their depth, with their diversity from a Connor to an Ehlers to a, to a Shifley, to a Dubois, to a Wheeler, um, you know, and to now a, Nito, a Nino Nita rider across the board, hey, if, if those are my six guys, I might put them in a room, Andrew, and say, figure it out. You know, I, I'm sure Rick Bonus has maybe said that to his power play at times. Lock they the find... door, by the way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, have you ever been with a team that's incredibly talented and has had success that just can't get anything done with the man advantage for an extended period of time? Now, the Jets did finally get one against the LA Kings. Pierre-Luc Dubois scored at the end of that five-minute power play. But it has been a huge issue for a team over the course of the past month or so, Dave. And you know how important those power plays are and the momentum it can stifle if you don't do anything on them. Um, uh, have you ever been on a team where it just, you know, it, you're in a complete funk? And what 
what can the coaching staff, what can the players do to kind of get their mojo back when it comes to a five on four play? Because we've seen it in the past. It's just not there right now. I have been on that team and it, and it's such a weapon in, in the playoffs because you get less opportunities in the playoffs and, you know, and plus you're playing a team seven times potentially and they game plan and they shut you down over the course of the playoffs. You can't just rely on it during the playoffs, but it is magnified in how important it was. I was on that team and, uh, <laughs> and I actually got on the power play because our power play wasn't performing and the coach was up. And the coach was Rick Bonus and was in Boston in the playoffs. And he was so frustrated at one point. We were without Bork and Neely, and he was so frustrated. And we had the ultra-talented Adam Oates on our team. And at one point during a playoff game, we got a power play, and Rick said, you know what? I don't really care who goes out. And as soon as he said that, Dave Reed and I jumped over the boards, and we got on the ice. And then he couldn't change us. And so he couldn't <laughs> He couldn't take Tell us me you off. scored, Dave. Tell me you we guys scored. We scored and we won a one nothing game against Montreal in the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> Super Dave Reed and I still laugh about that to this day. As soon as we heard, you know what? I don't really care. Boom, we were over the boards. <laughs> we were going. So sometimes it takes something that extreme. But, man, you just talk about the individuals you're talking about and the talent. You know, I, I'm, I'm picturing them, the way they whipped it around when they were at their best, the way they moved. I can picture Shifley either on the offside or in the bumper spot, the down low play to the to the bumper spot. Um, Connors, apparently, you know, Kyle Connors shooting the puck from everywhere and scoring from everywhere. It's there. And they have to refine it. TSN's Dave Poulin with us uh, here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Dave, as far as this Western Conference playoff race goes, a big setback for Nashville with a couple losses. They now are kind of below that line of if they made up their games in hand. But I'm, I wonder what you think about the Calgary Flames here with, with uh, what, eight games to go. They've got the Kings tonight, and then they've got the final seven games of teams under the playoff line and one game against the Winnipeg Jets. Um, they're four points back. Uh, they're, they've had a lot of ups and downs as well, and it seems like not all is right potentially in that room or with the coach, but this is still a good team. I mean, when you look at Calgary, can they make a run? How like, Will they be playing meaningful games in game 81-82 and forcing the Jets right to the limit? Well, they will, and I believe Winnipeg has to get there before 81-82. and 82. I believe it's in their hands before that with the five home games, with the one game remaining yeah. in San Jose. And as we talked about with that one game remaining against Calgary. So if you're saying it's four points, you know, I'm telling you, you controlled at least two of those points. And so you can take it to six points just on that win alone and, you know, and put it in your favor. Um, interestingly enough that, that Calgary and Florida have been maybe the two biggest disappointments and they made the biggest trade over the summer. And Huberto, you know, the number two scorer in the National Hockey League last year hasn't been as effective in in Calgary. But if you look at Matthew Kachuk, he's the fourth leading scorer in the league this year and doing everything for Florida, and they're still out of it. And it hasn't happened in those two cities. It hasn't happened in net in Calgary. And just their overall play it has not been that effective. And I don't see it, – it's not a light switch. You can't turn it on. And I think Winnipeg still has it in their control right now. You're telling me four points in a game against that team. It's up to Winnipeg to control it. Well, and uh, and the Jets do also have the benefit of um, the regulation and overtime wins. So they actually do have that tiebreaker as well. So you could almost say there's an extra point in there right now. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Florida Panthers. I, Dave, I really thought that the Panthers were making a big, big push and in the last week, they've lost some games that they simply had to have, including last night against the Ottawa Senators. They're now three points back of Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh has a game in hand. There's eight games left on the season. Is Paul Maurice's team just running out of road? I believe so. And they've got some tough games left. But last night going in, if you, if you look at, you know, you give Bill Zito, the general manager, credit for saying they won the President's Cup last year and he didn't think they were good enough to win in the playoffs and was willing to go out and get the component or the element that he felt was necessary in the playoffs. That was Matthew Kachuk played a dear price for it. 
it hasn't worked. How did it affect Barkov? We don't know, but it just hasn't worked. And, and I did this math this morning, and it was, they are 43 points behind where they were last year at the end of the year. So they, so they have eight games left, but they're 43 points back. That's staggering, staggering. And that's not on one player or two players or three players. That's an entire team effort. And, you know, and you watched last night, you watched a kid in Matt Sogard who played, I believe, I don't know, 14 or 15 NHL games playing against Bobrovsky, who makes $10 million a year, has won two Vesnas, and Sogard beats him and just head up, beats him. And, you know, it hasn't happened for them there. Great lesson in chemistry, by the way. And, and I wrote an article on the weekend about chemistry. It was pertaining to Toronto changing six players and continually changing their lines. And I, I jokingly put in there, we always use the word chemistry as if it's a favorable thing. And, Andrew, I don't know what your chemistry class was like in high school, but... <laughs> it was a mess. Is, mine had some pretty disastrous experiments going on. I can picture my big goggles and my rubber gloves and going, man, I don't think these two elements go together. And, uh, and we've seen that firsthand in, in Florida this year. And it'll, it'll be... You know, I, I don't think they get it done. I really don't. I think it, it stays. I, I thought that one of Pittsburgh or the Island was coming out, and I thought someone was going in, and I still think that might be the case, but it looks, you know, more and more like it's going to be a remote possibility. Hey, Dave, just before we go, um, you know, I'm sure there'll be lots of talk about penalties and league discipline as we get into the playoffs. But in the past week, Mike Hoffman gets cross-checked in the face, cut up badly, one game suspension. Same thing happens to Josh Morrissey on the weekend. Uh, Ten stitches outside, eight inside, one game suspension for Lazat. We always know they don't give as he heavy penalties in the playoffs. Uh, what's a, uh, what's a playoff cross check in the face. Now the $2,500 fine. One minute minor. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I was, I was doing the Montreal game in Boston and we saw it happen to me. That was a great opportunity for the league to do more than one game no because it wasn't even, wasn't even in the context of play. The puck hadn't dropped Andrew. And it had nothing to do with the game. There was nothing going on up to that point between Hoffman and Greer. Like, it was a face-off when every single face-off I've ever watched, the two players bump into each other. That happened. Uh, little whack. Then a cross-check in the face. Now, did he mean to cross-check him in the face? No. But he cross-checked him in the face. And in, to Mike Hoffman's credit, he came back. In the, for the, I believe the last shift, shift of the second period, and totally, you could see his face was just a mess. So that was the opportunity ahead of the Lazat play. Uh, the Lazat play was in the course of play, but still a cross check to the face. And so I, I don't, on a relative basis, I don't understand why a cross check to the face with visible damage. And, and there was visible damage in both cases. Doesn't merit more. I, I I was stunned that it was only one game with Hoffman. And then, I mean, because the precedent had been set literally a couple days before, we sort of were expecting the one game. But well, uh, to me, this is a real is problem easier. going into the playoffs. Yeah, well, the that deal in a way is easier for the league because they set the Hoffman, you know, they set that price with the Hoffman situation and it wasn't in the course of play. So with the Lazat, you say, well, it was in the course of play. You know, it was in the heat of the moment. Okay, but and I'm not a fan of either one. No doubt about it. Hey, before we go, Pooley, um, you know, we'll catch up in a couple weeks after the Masters. I know you're a big golf guy. You have any leans right now? Do you want to make a, a Masters green jacket prediction with us on the show before we uh, say goodbye? Ooh, boy, oh, boy. Mm. And by the way, we've got to keep match play on the uh, on the event. I, agree. I I love that event. It is so much fun. They could maybe add a couple more matches to the final. Maybe bring a couple QBs. Bring that Mahomes Allen matchup and have them playing behind the final matchup just to make just it better for TV. Just in case it gets done early, uh, it's so much fun to watch because that's let's face it, that's how we play golf every day, right? We play match play. We don't play. We keep our stroke play, but we play match play. You're up one hole. I'm not up six strokes. You know, after the yeah. first hole. Because I've thumped you on the hard par four. Um, 
you know what? I'm going to continue to do what I do. I tell everyone at TSN that I'm going down to the Masters this year. I'm involved in the call um, because one day I think they're going to forget and they're just going to send me down there. And <laughs> still one of my favorite life sporting experiences. And you know what? It's, uh, it's a special time. Man, Scotty Scheffler is as cool as a cucumber. Just is. He just is nonplussed. He gets, you know, there's a lot of guys playing well right now, but I'm, I'm not going to give it to Scotty. I'm going to, I'm going Rory. Uh, wouldn't that I'm be amazing Rory. for him and for the Rory. game? I mean, yeah. he could make that happen. Special guy, and, and he's playing well right now. Um, I think he gets it done. Hey, yeah, uh, you're in the States right now. You can order one of those uh, ma Masters uh, hosting kits and uh, get your pimento cheese and all that stuff. Send them to, tell them to deliver it to the hotel. You can bring it back and you can be up there north of Toronto with the ultimate Masters party for those of us north of the border. I very well may do that. I'm looking forward <laughs> to it very much as well. So enjoy that. And we will chat shorty, shortly after and talk about Rory's big win. Over, really? Scott. <laughs> Have a great call tonight. Thanks so much for doing this. Thanks, Andrew. Oh, man, great stuff with Dave Poole and just love having Dave on. And what a hilarious power play story he said. Remus actually found the clip. Maybe we'll tweet that out a little bit later on. Check out the uh, Sports Talk WPG Twitter feed and make sure you're following us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, all of your favorite platforms at Sports Talk WPG. And while you're at it, folks, if you're with us right now, make sure you've hit that red subscribe button, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and you know you can get your uh, Winnipeg Sports Talk fix on audio podcast by searching Winnipeg Sports Talk and subscribing wherever you get your favorite pods. Um, huge thanks to our friends at Royal Sports. You know, spring is just around the corner. Um, well, that's what they tell us, at least. And Royal Sports not only is the best spot to get all your favorite fan gear with the best selection of merchandise from around the world of sports, and you know they're ready for spring break with the snowboards, boots, and bindings and the best hockey selection in town. But yes, the snow will be melting. So you soccer players, baseball and softball players, tennis and more, get on down to Royal Sports and get ready to get back on out there and enjoying every single minute of spring and summer when you're able to do it. Um, all you got to do is get on down to 750 Pemina Highway at the Royal Sports Superstore, along with King Skate, Snow, and Surf. And make sure to follow them on Instagram, at Royal Sports Pemina, for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. Um, guys, as we get into the new seasons, uh, how's the closet looking? Is your menswear uh, ready to roll? Going to have some nice events, maybe some weddings in the summer. Might be time for a trip down to see Andrew and his great staff at F Apparel at 190 Smith Street downtown. Custom suits for men beginning at just $400. But more than just suits, they've got golf pants, chinos, and more. And a great selection of custom shirts, both to be worn tucked in as well as untucked styles to get you set up and looking good. Custom made to fit as only F Apparel can do it. Hey, if you're at a wedding party this summer, make sure to ask them about the 15% discount when the entire wedding party gets suited up at F Apparel. And if you've got a 2023 high school grad in the family, get the young man a new suit to help him transition to the next stage of his life. And F Apparel will hook him up with a free custom shirt and tie valued at about $150. F Apparel. It's ephapparel.com online. You can find out more, make an appointment there, or pop down and see them at 190 Smith Street downtown. And uh, hey, we got a late game tonight, 9.30 p.m. Now, I know some people normally like to get tucked in a little earlier. I, though, think it's a great time to go out. And double dose of Boston pizza. You can take advantage of the Appy Hour specials from 9 to 12 and Jets hockey tonight. Of course, the one thing that you can guarantee get is the big game on the big screen with big sound, ice-cold schooners, world-famous Boston wings, gourmet pizzas, and more. And if you are staying home tonight, and maybe it's a little too late, you can always get the great taste of Boston pizza delivered to your door hot and ready at bostonpizza.com. All right, let's uh, get back to the Jets and this game tonight against the San Jose Sharks with Mike McIntyre, who uh, was out in Southern California and joins us now back in the peg. What's going on, Mike? How are you? 
Huss, good to be here. Good to be back home. Um, it's been a long stretch of travel because I was on that last road trip through Florida and Carolina, came home for one and a half days, and then it was off to uh, Vegas for some holidays with my wife, and then uh, uh, both games in Southern California. I'm not on the the final leg of this road trip, the Northern California trek. 9.30 start tonight means uh, we're not getting this one in the paper. Uh, it's for the web only. So I'm covering this one remotely and uh, happy to be home. Piper and Bodie, the two dogs, uh, two rescues, they're actually sleeping here at my feet right now. Hopefully they uh, mind their manners during our chat, although I know some of the, the viewers out there like when Piper gets a little rambunctious. So we'll see what the next 20 minutes or so brings. But uh, it's good to be home. Wish there was a little less snow on the ground, but uh, hey, it's hockey weather still, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, it certainly is hockey weather, and we could use some playoff hockey weather, yes. which sometimes comes with some nicer temperatures. But first things first, we'll see what happens tonight in San Jose. Listen, before we get to tonight's game, I, I had to laugh because you were basically, you tweeted exactly what I was thinking. I mean, you said of all the games that I've covered for the Winnipeg Jets, this was one of them. Um, yes. <laughs> A game that didn't really stand out in in a any way, shape, or form. Maybe with the exception of a power play goal, which has been such a long time coming. But uh, before we get to you know how this team is looking and what's going on around the team heading into tonight, uh, wanted to get your thoughts after being at Crypto.com Arena on the weekend and what you saw Saturday afternoon when the Jets uh, lost to the LA Kings. Well, I'll say this, if the Jets are going to squeak into the playoffs, they they should hope they don't face the LA Kings, because uh, uh, which is a possible first-round matchup, of course. LA is right there with Vegas uh, in the hunt for first place in the Pacific. I mean, to me, the Jets, they were a distant second on the day in terms of the, the quality of of effort and compete. Uh, the Kings were buzzsaws. They're, they're a fast team. And, you know, they made the Jets look slow and disorganized and, you know, you name it. The Jets, they weren't very good. Um, I know the score says they only lost by a couple plus the empty netter. Um, but to me, the game was never really in, in doubt. Um, you know, the Jets, for whatever reason, they just uh, could not get out of neutral, uh, you know, and, and kick it into a higher gear. And, you know, the, the, the same kind of sins that continue to plague this team of late, um, the, the top guys aren't scoring, the power play is ice cold, they're giving up goals at the worst possible times, you know, right in the opening minute or two of periods. Um, they're their own worst enemy right now. And uh, I thought Saturday kind of encapsulated a lot of what's kind of gone wrong with this team lately. Well, and, and something that's been happening a lot lately is uh, giving up early leads. It happened yeah. again last night. And, you know, obviously they did get that power play goal to kind of get them back in the game. But from my perspective, Mike, and again, you were there, I wasn't. Um, it just looked like the Kings had, uh, it almost seemed easy in, in the last 30 minutes of the game. I mean, there was not really that push from Winnipeg. They had such a tough time getting through that 1-3-1. And this will maybe lead to, you know, a couple of the lineup changes. Um, you know, even when they decided that they had to go and dump the puck in, uh, there wasn't really many even 50-50 no. battles when it came to the pucks. I mean, the Kings sort of had it and moved it out. And um, it was a pretty routine and easy afternoon for Jonas Corposalo in his new net. It really was. It's not like he stole that game for the Kings. And, Hus, you know, maybe to me the most surprising thing and, I might say concerning thing from the Jets perspective is, you know, when, when Josh Morrissey takes that vicious cross check to the face from Blake Lazard and the Jets see their, you know, arguably their MVP, their all-star defenseman um, cut open and, you know, have to go to the room for repairs. They're gifted. And I say gifted because it was a totally stupid play by Blake Lazard. They're handed a five-minute power play. And I know they got the one goal, but it's not like they generated really any momentum out of that. And, of course, they gave that goal back, you know, right off the hop to start the third period. I, I'm just shocked 
quite frankly, that the team, and it goes to the theme that we've seen lately, there seems to be no killer instinct from this group. And to me, if ever there was something to rally around, sort of a let's ram it down their throats, let's stick it to them, it's when you get a penalty like that and you see a teammate go down. And I just didn't see that kind of fight from the Jets. Um, you know, they had a great opportunity and they ended up going, I think, one for six on the power play. So what they're one for their last 27 and so many of those 27 power plays have just been absolutely forgettable where they barely establish control. If they're shooting the puck, it's 10 feet wide or 10 feet high. There's just no semblance of organization or structure right now. And It'd be one thing if we were talking about preseason or first couple of weeks of the season. This is, they're going to play game 75 tonight. And the fact that this is the way they look. And again, you have to give some um, credit to the opponent for sure. And the Kings are so structurally sound, they can make you look foolish. I just find it alarming that the Jets couldn't find another gear, especially with how that game played out. Uh, because to me, that could have been a rallying point, and it ended up kind of going for naught. Well, and, and, and there's another part of it that just speaks to the emotional makeup of this club. But, you know, when a cheap shot's taken against one of your most important popular players on that club, you know, you would think that there might be some sort of response in some way. And this yeah. is not the first time we've said that. I mean, I watch these games in the East like I watched that Boston Carolina game on Sunday right. afternoon and the, the the compete level that these teams are going at it with the amount of scrums the um you know the 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 will to engage opponents and beat them I mean honestly sometimes it looks like we're watching two different leagues at the time yeah. right now Mike um and I mean you know there's a lot of guys that you know, you know when called upon will go and do that but from a team perspective um th- there's just there's obviously something missing right now and uh, i think both in the pushback from that event on the ice but also just the emotional level of engaging the kings after something like that happened that's got to be really frustrating for a coach like Rick Bonus, who has said, you run one of us, you run all of us right now. And you wouldn't have known by watching the third period that anything had happened earlier in the game. No, there's almost a, a resigned to their fate kind of feeling right now around this team. Huss. A, a woe is us, you know, feeling sorry for themselves. And, and I dare say it goes even beyond just what we're seeing, you know, kind of between the whistles in the games. Like, having attended a bunch of morning skates and practices lately, there's not a lot of pep in their step. Uh, These are very quiet skates right now. You've got Rick Bonus there, you know, he's what, 68 years old, and he's screaming his head off, trying to bring up the intensity at some of these skates. And, you know, so you you give the the veteran coach credit, and I got to think, and we're we're, kind of seeing it, through what Rick Bonus is saying and maybe what he's not saying and even his body language. Like, after the game the other day at Crypto.com, when we were down outside the Jets' room, I must say that's as perplexed and dumbfounded as I've seen Rick Bonus all year. Like, the frustration was palpable because, as you say, Huss, all the things he wants this team to be that he's said almost ad nauseum from training camp on, about, you know, not playing on their heels, playing on their toes, about the passion, the emotion. That's all but disappeared here lately. And I, I don't think Rick, I mean, we, we don't really have answers for it. I don't think the head coach really has answers for it. And it's why, you know, there's almost the, the feeling that at this point, he's just kind of rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, as the old saying goes, by moving some pieces around and, you know, he's already played the benching card, right, with his top guys. And I, I'm sure we'll get into this here. But to me, that clearly hasn't worked at all with with a Mark Shifley. In fact, if anything, Shifley's more disengaged post-benching than he was oh, pre-benching. This is, this is the worst-case scenario for that. I mean, I totally understand why Rick played that card. And the expectations are is that guys will respond. Well, 
I mean, there's been some response, but it <laughs> has been, I mean, in the worst possible way. Let me ask you, I mean, obviously we'll get into Shifley and to a lesser extent Wheeler right now with their struggles, but you were there. Um, I, I'm interested in what you notice from them on the ice as well as any body language because that, when Mark's been in real funks and we've seen it before, we certainly saw it at the end of last year, the body language was terrible. Is there anything yeah. that showed you that maybe he was, um, you know, a little bit more engaged or a little bit more, um, uh, brought a little bit more will to the game right now, or was it just more frustration? Um, as I did know, I believe it was you that mentioned there was a big slam of the door at one point on the, uh, on the bench. Yeah. In my, uh, in my column I wrote yesterday, I, I mentioned uh, right off the top in the column that, you know, late in that third period, he he gave the bench a mighty slam as he kind of slowly, and I mean slowly, got off the ice on a line change, like really slow, way behind the play. And, you know, he, it, that slam of the gate, which we could hear very loud, I don't know if it was caught on TV, I assume not because it was so far behind the play, uh, but we could hear the, the bang up in the press box. And as I wrote in my piece, Huss, um, that was the only impact Mark Shifley made all game, and it was on the bench. Um, now, I'll say this, and is that a good sign that he's frustrated and showing some emotion? Uh, you'd like him to channel that emotion in a more positive way. He's not doing any damage to the gate by slamming it. Um, so go out there then and do something that helps your team. Um, and, you know, so I'm really curious to see what we get from Mark Shifley tonight. This is a guy who has been invisible. And I get, Haas, there will be people who say it's unfair to pick on Mark Shifley. He's got 38 goals. He's the team's top scorer. But the fact is, that's his job. And his strong play early in the season it, is what makes this so jarring. We saw a really good engaged Mark Shifley through the first half of the year and the team was winning and Mark Shifley was playing extremely well and everything was great. Something has changed dramatically. And when you have a Mark Shifley who who's getting 20 plus minutes a game, who's on the top power play. I mean, he got six minutes of power play time the other day, us, and he had zero shots on goal. How does that even happen? Um, and Rick Bonus talked more about it yesterday, how we can't just keep telling him, shoot the puck, shoot the puck. But to me, that that's a player who's who looks lost, who looks completely checked out. And response that you'd want after that benching. And I think in the six games he's played us, no goals, one assist. He's something like minus 13 in his last, whatever, eight games. And it's noteworthy. Mark Shifley rarely has a game where he doesn't get a shot on goal. Uh, We're 74 games into the year. I believe there's been five of 74. But three of them have come in the last six since the benching. That's just not acceptable. And, you know, I don't know what's left. They're they're trying a new winger with him tonight in Nemestikov. Um, I know some look at it as Nikolai Ehlers being demoted to the third line. I think it's actually a promotion for Nikolai Ehlers. Uh, okay, that is exactly what I said off the top of the show. I did see some disconcerting. I mean, listen, Adam Lowry and Mason Appleton are two of the players that have actually been doing what the coaches wanted them to do, get to the net. I mean, right. think of the, the goals Adam Lowry has scored. And listen, he took a hell of a lot of heat for going 30-whatever games without scoring through a really long extended slump. Look at the games that the Winnipeg Jets have won in the last few weeks. <clears throat> Nashville, Arizona, Anaheim, Adam Lowry with either the winning goal or a massive goal in all three of those games. And when I think about, like, listen, in a perfect scenario, Nikolai Ehlers is not playing with Adam Lowry. He's no. on a line that's going right now that gets the most out of him. But I think right now with what Rick Bonus has been dealt with, I, I honestly think that the move of Ehlers to the Lowry line will allow Ehlers to be the offensive catalyst on it, as Rick said yesterday, to get the puck, to skate with the puck, to create himself. And I know that when he shoots the puck, 
he'll have a pretty darn good chance of having either 17 or 22 somewhere in those dirty areas to pop one in as both of them have done recently. Right. And the other thing is, and I mean, you can tell me from watching this game, I mean, I didn't think Ehlers was particularly good on Saturday either, but I mean, splitting those guys, when you have those guys playing together and to be so ineffective as a line, you almost have to split them up and do something else. And I think if you look at the last few weeks, they've been getting far more in a lot of categories from 27 than they have from 55. And I know a lot of people in the chat will go with Blake Wheeler. I mean, listen, Wheeler, I I, I can't say enough of the way he handled the captaincy thing at the start of the year and the way he played. Um, This is either the law of diminishing returns right staring us in the face or a player that still is hampered or just is simply not the same from that injury that kept them out earlier in the lineup because it really does seem like it's sort of night and day. And I'm not sure how much we can expect it of Blake. I mean, I'll always respect the effort that he puts forward. It's not like he's out there dogging it. It just isn't happening for him. But to me, Nikola Ehlers moving with Adam Lowry and uh, Mason Apple to me is a better situation for him, a better situation for the team. And you can number the lines however you want. I know which line Rick Bonus trusts a heck of a lot more between those two, and it's the one with Adam Lowry at center. I'll be really curious to see the ice time, yeah. especially five on five ice time after the game tonight, Huss, because one way of looking at this, I know it was sort of reported that Nikola Ehlers got moved down to the third line. Maybe we're looking at it wrong. Maybe Adam Lowry and Mason Appleton got bumped up to the second line, and Mark Shifley and Blake Wheeler were the ones who got moved down to the third line with Vlad Domestikov. And if that's the case, again, we'll see what the ice time is tonight. And if there's a lot of power play, you know, Mark Shifley is going to be on the top unit. But I do wonder if, if in a way, Mark Shifley is now centering the third line. And Blake Wheeler is where a lot of folks think he should be, which is a third line winger. Um, because Appleton and Lowry have actually moved up. And, and as you pointed out, they've been very effective Lately, Lowry's got the three goals in the last five games. He's actually been one of their hottest scorers. And you know, Huss, the the compete, the effort is always going to be there from from Lowry and Appleton. They play a very direct, straight-line game, and maybe that can work well with the Nikolai Ehlers, who, as you say, Rick Bonus, he didn't like his game Saturday. To be frank, not a whole lot of the guys played very well. One of the things clearly Rick Bonus didn't like is, you know, Nikolai Ehlers... Um, too many drop passes, too much, some of the same things we often hear, too much east-west, not enough north-south. Um, but something had to give. And I'll say this, Huss, I, I actually sat uh, in Anaheim the other night. Um, my wife was with me at the game, so I wasn't up in the press box. I actually sat near ice level. And that's the first time probably in six years that I've watched a Jets game that close to the ice, normally up in the press box. It's great. We can see kind of the play developing. The game looks pretty easy from way up there. Ice level is a very different thing. And I was really close. There was almost nobody in the barn uh, at the Honda Center. So we were very close to the ice. It was very telling to watch a game that way. And it's something that I should do more often. I'll say this about Blake Wheeler. He, He is so slow. Um, you know, the reads, the, the movement, and it really stands out when you're that close to the ice. And again, is this just the toll of a long season at his age? He's had injury issues, of course. Um, law of diminishing returns, as you say. I, I think there's still a player there in Blake Wheeler, but not in the way perhaps that Rick Bonus has been trying to use him. And again, you look at the power play and how ineffective it's been. For so long, a lot of the power play has kind of run through Blake Wheeler. He's the, the the puck distributor, the playmaker. Those plays aren't being made. Those pucks aren't being distributed. Um, it looks like Blake Wheeler's, you know, he's not getting bumped, um, certainly off the power play entirely. But we may see Rick Bonus utilize his power play units a little differently. Um, but it is, you know, when you have... Shifley appearing to be disengaged and Wheeler clearly struggling this late in the season to kind of keep up. It's not a really good combination when that is your second line. So we'll see how it plays out tonight. 
Um, but a very interesting scenario to keep an eye on for sure. Well, and uh, what's up to the Jets Pope who uh, pops in and chat and says, Ehlers showed more heart when he had that fight than yeah. anyone has on the team in the past month. And, you know, listen, he some of the things that Rick Bonus has been saying, I think, you know, last game notwithstanding – has resonated with Ehlers. He's been listening. I mean, he's been shooting the puck more. He yeah. and he was one of the few guys that was actually scoring or at least generating chances. And much like Kyle Connor looked like a different player when he got off that line and was playing with Pierre Luc Dubois a couple games ago, um, I think Rick Bonus is hoping that same boost happens for Ehlers playing with you know two very different players and not as offensively skilled but ones that you know you can count on being in the game from the drop of the puck tonight at 9.30. For sure. And again, I go back to the idea that it's it's usually not a good sign when you're getting ready to play game 75 and you're still trying to figure this out. It'd be one thing, Huss, if the Jets were injury riddled and you had to juggle your lineup because of, of circumstance. That's not the case. You know, Cole Perfetti... And Sam Gagne are the only two injured players, but they've both been out for a while. And so there's no line, there's no injuries forcing lineup juggling. It's strictly performance and effort, um, you know, and production related. And so it's not a good sign at all if you're the Jets. Um, you're running out of kind of runway here to to get your house in order. Um, and this is a game tonight, clearly, uh, given the state of the Sharks and where Winnipeg stands right now. This is a game that they cannot afford to do anything but get two points out of. And, you know, the Sharks have, what, one win in the last 15, is it? And that win was against the Jets. Um, so can can Lightning strike twice or can Sharks strike twice? Uh, if you're the Jets, you better hope not. Um, because this is a night and you look at the out-of-town uh, scoreboard as well. You know, the Predators have a tough matchup tonight. Uh, the Flames have a tough matchup tonight. And the Jets do not. So this has the potential to be a productive night on paper. But as the saying goes, the game's played on the ice and we'll see how it plays out. Well, our favorite saying is courtesy of Dennis Bernstein of the first <laughs> period who joined us last week saying, must win? Mm, I wouldn't say so. <laughs> but it's a can't lose. Yes. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, and, and listen, I've been talking quite a bit about this, kind of really looking ahead to the rest of the schedule. I think this game actually is must win, can't lose, whatever you want to call it. They have to have two points tonight, and they got to get it against the Detroit Red Wings on Friday night. Because, Mike, yes, Calgary plays the Kings tonight. They've got eight games remaining. After this game, they get Arizona, Vancouver, and Vancouver has been playing a lot better, but again, still a team on the outside. Of th right. The Jets are the only team currently above the playoff line that Calgary gets after this game. And, you know, the Jets do have the four-point cushion right now, but if Calgary was to eat into that this week, as opposed yeah. to at minimum stay where you are, all of a sudden, things get a little more interesting. And, of course, there's a head-to-head -head matchup right here in Winnipeg on the 5th of April. You've got a very good New Jersey team that's dominated on the road all year coming in. And those final two games on the road against Minnesota and Colorado, like the Calgary Flames schedule is way, way um, lighter, if you will, going sure. the rest of the way. And, and that's why I think that there has to be – I mean, listen, there should be this level of urgency with the situation this team's in to begin with. Um, but to me, f they have to get four points. And at that point, they will maybe not have to look at the scoreboard out right. of town quite as much if they take care of business this week. Well, and if you're the Jets, it, you, you can't or you, you don't want a scenario where it comes down to those last two games on the road um, and and possibly even needing some help on the out-of-town scoreboard in addition to having to handle your business. Because, you know, while both Minnesota and Colorado that final week will likely be home and cooled when it comes to a playoff spot, those two teams are likely going to be competing right down to the wire for top spot in the Central Division and, heck, maybe in the Western Conference and the home ice that that brings with it. So... You know, th don't expect the Wild and or the Avalanche to maybe be resting some players for that final game or two uh, because those games actually may carry a ton of meaning 
uh, to those opponents. And so if you're the Jets, you're right. You look at this, the, the strength of schedule. These next two games tonight and Friday is about as easy as it gets. I know they get the Sharks one more time as well uh, it, it, near the end of that homestand, but uh, there are some tough games in there. And if, if you look at it, Haas and figure the Jets at bare minimum probably need to go four and four over these last eight games, if you're trying to figure out where four of those wins, eight of those points are going to come from, um, if they don't get at least two tonight against the Sharks, now you're really in in full-on scramble and maybe panic mode. Mike McIntyre with us uh, here from the Winnipeg Free Press getting ready for a 9.30 puck drop tonight between the Jets and the San Jose Sharks. I want to get back to Bones for a minute because – He's dealing with a lot right now. I mean, I think he sort of played that card a couple of weeks ago and we've talked about how the, the reaction from, well, obviously Mark Scheifele in particular has not really benefited the team. You've been around him all year long, Mike. Um, you know, you mentioned sort of how he looked after and how he sounded after the LA game. We just watched some of his clips after practice yesterday and I don't know, it was a combination of maybe exasperation. Um, I think he's probably couching some of the things that he'd say that he'd probably like to say that might not be right beneficial for a public forum. But, I, I mean, I, I just wanted to hear from you uh, what you what you see when you look at Rick Bonus and you hear him speaking right now for a guy with so much experience and a team that, you know, he seemed to push all the right buttons earlier this year. Um now it seems like he and the rest of the coaching staff sort of banging their heads uh, against a wall a little bit. I joked with uh, Weber the other day that, you know, maybe this summer, Paul Maurice, Dave Lowry, and Rick Bonus will all get together somewhere and almost have an emotional support uh, meeting between the three of them. Get all where... those guys in a boat out at Aikens Lake for a few days. Right, and I, I would suspect if that were to happen... Uh, Paul Maurice and to a lesser extent Dave Lowry would probably have kind of a smirk on their faces as Bones rolls up to the scene kind of an, an I told you so or I see you've, you've discovered what we already learned about this group haven't you and that is to say it's clear Haas that, that this Jets group and when we talk about the group you have to talk about the core because so much of that core has remained the same over a lengthy period of time. And when some of these same issues, you know, and to me, this season has very similar vibes as to the 2018-19 campaign. Granted, this year's maybe peak wasn't quite as high as 2018-19, where the Jets I think around Christmas, we're pretty much in the running for number one in the NHL. And then their game went off a cliff. And maybe the Valley won't be as as extreme either as it was that year. Um, and it also has similar vibes to last season where the Jets, what were they, 9-3-3, three, and three, you know, almost at U.S. Thanksgiving, they were right there in the hunt. And then again, the game went off a cliff and Paul Maurice resigned. Like we've seen this act play out before. Rick Bonus, though, he's seeing it for the first time. And uh, the more we spend around Rick Bonus, this is a guy who's probably seen just about everything over his lengthy NHL career. I really wonder, Huss, if he's ever seen anything quite like this. That This is a coach who, you know, maybe he was warned or had some inkling of what he was getting into. But when things went so well kind of off the hop, I almost wonder if if he got fooled into thinking, yeah, oh, well, everyone was making too much of this or it was blown out of proportion. Well, you know what? He's now seeing with his own eyes up close um, some of the flaws with the makeup of this roster um, and clearly the challenges in terms of of the personalities of certain players, of of finding what makes them tick, of of finding ways to motivate It's bizarre to me, Huss, that we're still talking about, you know, motivation. There was that great exchange with Billick and Rick Rick (laughs) Bonus. That's what we're dealing with. Right. I mean, you would think that these guys shouldn't need constantly to be to be motivated. And yet it's clear from what Rick Bonus is saying and even what he's not, that 
that is a major issue. And I don't understand it. I thought some of these issues that had been addressed early in the year with, you know, the pledge the players made, the promises to each other about holding each other accountable and all that. It just seems like so much of that has kind of gone out the window and we're back. We're back where we always end up with this group. And I think it's why rumblings are increasing around the league, Huss, that there is a day of reckoning coming for this organization in a major way, um, regardless of how the rest of this season plays out, that, you know, some lessons have been learned. No doubt, I'd love to know what, what Rick Bonus is telling Kevin Day off and, and ownership. Like, what has he said about things he's learned? And are they taking that to heart? He was brought in to be that breath of fresh air. I think he has been. Um, but I suspect that he's relaying some very interesting messages to management and ownership about this group. Well, and to be honest with you, I mean, they've seen this before. I mean, I'm not even sure they need Rick Bonus to walk in and tell them anything. Um, I think Kevin Cheveldayoff. And, and listen, this goes back to last year. We've been talking about this potentially moving around the core, maybe a time to move on. And, you know, I made the case last year in November that maybe they need to start thinking about this with the value of that contract and what they right. might be able to get because the change is going to happen sooner or later. They'll be forced into it one way or the other because you got one year left on these deals. There's no way they can just roll through next season and lose guys for nothing. But it is interesting, and we'll finish this on this. I mean, we know that Darren Drager is quite tied into Chevy. Yeah. We've now heard from him and some of the other insiders, uh, you know, much louder of things that we've been talking about for months, going back to last season and even before about this club. It does seem like when that starts happening, you know where it's coming from, and it's pretty clear that I think that I don't know whether you want to call it resignation or, but a conclusion of what needs to happen and. That is going to mean we're going to have a pretty busy summer on this show and uh, in the pages of the Freak for you. Oh, we sure are. And, um, you know, if the Jets were to completely kind of fall right out of this playoff race entirely, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know how different things may play out if they just squeak in versus not getting in at all. Um, you know, of course, if they get in the playoffs, as the old saying goes, you know, it's a whole new season. Um Anything can happen, I suppose, although the way the Jets have played as of late, not exactly inspiring any kind of hope that they could do any damage or make noise, but they still have Connor Hellebuck, and, you know, maybe they find a way to, to get it figured out. But, uh, no, it, it does seem that, um, you know, we're, we're reaching kind of a crossroads here, and like you say with Drager and Friedman, some of those guys, there's a lot of smoke around this team right now, and I dare say that, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. And we're going to see a lot of fire here uh, in, in the not-too-distant future. Um, on hand, uh, you know, up, up next, though, is how they respond tonight. Uh, clearly, you know, they've been challenged again by their coach. We've seen that happen time and time again. Um, are they up for the challenge against uh, an inferior opponent? Uh, we will soon find out. Uh, but this is a game that they just simply can't afford, as you say, to lose. Yeah, well, we'll look forward to seeing what happens tonight. Ehlers promoted to the second line, and uh, we'll uh, <laughs> see what we get out of the rest of the crew uh, tonight. Mike, thanks as always. Great stuff. Say hi to the dogs for uh, everyone in chat, and uh, we'll do this again next week. Enjoy the game tonight. You bet. Huss, take care. Good stuff. All right, there is Mike McIntyre of the Winnipeg Free Press. All right. Hey, gang, uh, by the way, over 400 people in chat. Awesome crew today. Hit that red subscribe button if you haven't. And I'm dropping into the chat right now the link for tomorrow's sports trivia night down at Little Brown Jug. If you didn't know, our second ever event. The first one was amazing. We're doing another one tomorrow. Finishing up all the questions tonight before the game. Hopefully we'll see you there. Uh, Remus has pinned it in the chat. And if you're listening on the podcast, go to winnipegsportstalk.com. Right at the top, there's a link to get your tickets for Sports Trivia Night, obviously we've got limited seating, so we want to make sure that everyone that wants to come is able to do so. So jump on those tickets, and we'll see you tomorrow over at Little Brown Jug. We're going to be talking Bombers right now, but don't forget Jeff Gustafson, the boss of Bass, coming up later on in the program as well after his win at the Bass Masters Classic. Uh, but really looking forward to uh, our next guest from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And, of course, 
Princess Auto, big sponsors of the Bombers and your friends here at Winnipeg Sports Talk. And also where you'll find the best deals and the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Pop by and see them at either the Panet Road location or Portage Avenue West. You can always shop online 24-7, 365 over at princessauto.com. Uh, if you got water needs in town, you know where to go. The Culligan Experts, family owned for over 65 years, doing it both in Winnipeg and around southern Manitoba. And the leaders in water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems and drinking water systems, citywide water delivery services, and commercial and industrial water products and solutions. They're over at 1200 Sargent Avenue. You can give them a call at 694-5180 and check out everything Culligan can do for you and your family online at drinkculligan.com. And just before we bring in Brady Oliveira, big cheers to another bomber sponsor, our friends at Canadian Club, the official spirit and whiskey of the blue and gold. We'll be a minute before we're back at IG Field enjoying a CC and ginger ale, but good news they're now available in 473 milliliter cans at both Manitoba Liquor Marts and your favorite beer vendor. Look around, ask for it if you don't see it on your next visit. And of course, you can pick up the great taste of Canadian Club, Canada's favorite Canadian whiskey at any Manitoba Liquor Marts. All right, let's welcome in from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, the recipient announced yesterday of the Cal Murphy Heart of a Legend Award Bomber running back, Brady Oliveira. Brady, what's up? Welcome back to WST. How are you? Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. How are you doing? Uh, oh, Fred, we're doing great. You know, ups and downs of the hockey team, keeping us busy right now. Everyone looking forward to football season coming up. Um, but listen, we wanted to get you on, talk a little bit about the off season and look ahead to the upcoming year. But first things first, um, congratulations on that Cal Murphy Heart of a Legend Award. I know you and Willie J, who, of course, won the Ed Cottowich Good Guy Award, um, have done so much in the community and uh, figured it would be a great day to get you on to give you a little bit of dap for that and uh, talk about it. What was the reaction when you heard that uh, you got such a great honor from the team? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I was actually in the middle of a meeting um, talking about kind of planning next steps with my whole dog rescue stuff that I do. Um, so that was the meeting revolving around that. And I, I kind of checked my phone and I got a notification um, from Ed Tate, our, our writer for BlueMarbers.com, who tweeted at me saying that, oh, you know, I was awarded the Cal Murphy Award. And um, yeah, just such a great honor. I mean, you know, Cal Murphy was a legend, uh, you know, won many, many, you know, great cups and, and did a lot of great things. And for me to be, you know, um, selected and as, you know, a recipient of that award, um, pretty special. Well, and a big part of this, I mean, we've seen some of the pieces on social media. We've heard the stories. You've talked about it before. Um, your love of dogs and your work when it comes to rescues. Um, there will be some people that aren't familiar with it. So tell us a little bit about um, this passion of yours and uh, and what you've been up to when it comes to that. Yeah, uh, for sure. Strong passion of mine, I think, in any aspect of any field that we're looking at. It's, you know, I just like to give back and um, you know, I'm a very charismatic person and, and wherever I can, you know, do good and give back and lend a helping hand, you know, I'm the first one to always do it. And, um, you know, now I'm in a field of, you know, animal rescue and, and, and extremely passionate about it. And I think, you know, when I started it in Manitoba here, it was just, it's a severe issue that many people don't really know what's going on across Northern Manitoba with the overpopulation of canines. So when I became aware of it and I knew how bad the situation was, I immediately knew that this is something that I got to make a difference in. And then as I continued my journey of, you know, trying to be a voice for the voiceless and help as many, you know, stray dogs as possible, I started to do that abroad now. You know, my my passion of, you know, traveling and in the off season and, and enjoying my time off. I mean, obviously the bomber season, you know, that six months is a very time demanding six months and, and you go through a lot. So when you have that time off, you definitely got to enjoy it. But I've been starting to, you know, plan my travel destinations around the line of animal rescue work just because I'm so passionate about it. And anywhere you go, it seems to be an issue. So I did, you know, two years ago in Mexico for six weeks rescuing out there. I just did two months in Bali, which was one of the best trips that I've ever taken in my entire life. But the dog situation out there is next level, um, never ending. Everywhere you go, there's just a dog that's skin and bones that truly needs help. But 
uh my girlfriend and i got lots of good work done out there and and yeah i mean it's just a passion of mine it, it seems to be that it's it's everywhere you go there is a dog or two that are in need that need your help and um yeah i so happen to you know to be passionate about that and want to try and make a difference uh in everywhere i go you know i, I mean you mentioned you know kind of taking this show on the road to, to bali and mexico but i want to ask you about northern manitoba because i mean so many of us in the city many people don't even get outside the perimeter very much, but we have a massive, massive province, um, and things are very different up north, especially when it comes to um, to dogs. Uh, I mean, I remember seeing, I believe, that first video that got a lot of run on social media about that trip up north. But I mean, what 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 should people know about the situation when it comes to dogs? And you know, how can maybe someone that is here not necessarily able to go up there, but you know, that has that sort of heart for, for pets and for dogs may be able to help. What have you learned on that? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think, you know, me being, you know, from Winnipeg and, and a proud Manitoban, you know, I want to make an impact first, you know, where I'm from, where my roots are. And I do a ton of work across Northern Manitoba. And, you know, one thing that I've noticed is, you know, the people, it, it's, it's so remote, like these communities are so remote and, most of them don't have the means to take care of the dog. So when I go up there, you know, I, I want to be a positive influence in the community. I want to do anything that I can do to help, whether that is, you know, bringing food up into the community. You know, people still love their dogs out there. It's just that, you know, they might not be able to afford a, you know, a dog, a bag, uh, a bag of dog food. So, you know, I'm going to be that for them and bring their, bring their dog some food. Um, so, you know, just little things like that. Um, educating the people when I go up there, you know, the importance of spay and neuter, um, good dog ownership. Um, but I, I just think it's it's so remote and it's hard for people to, you know, just drive into the city and, and get their dogs, you know, fixed. So we just want to be a positive influence when we go into these communities. And I, and I think, you know, when you look at people in the city here and, and ways that they can help, because it, it really is never ending in these communities across northern Manitoba. And it's just, there's so many dogs and there's only so many dogs that we can take in because, you know, I mean, where are we going to put them? I can't keep them all in my house. I wish I could, but I, I can't. So I think a, a way where people can help is, uh, you know, the rescue that I volunteer with here in Manitoba is called Canine Advocates Manitoba. We run strictly off of fosters. So I think if you can open your home, uh, love a dog for a couple of weeks until, you know, their transport's ready until their next leg of their adventure is ready. Um, that's a huge help. Um, other ways to help, you know, share sharing on social media i mean supporting people share a post because you never know where that post is gonna gonna go and who's gonna see it um and of course donating whatever that you know if, if it's five bucks ten bucks a hundred bucks you know anything help it all goes a long way um so i would say yeah support your local rescue i know there's lots of great rescue groups in winnipeg um i do lots of work with the humane society so um yeah i think just Finding a rescue that you trust and truly believe in and, and hop on their back and, and really support them along the way because it really is a journey and you know, there's, there's lots of tough times in this whole rescue gig and, and things you wish you can unsee, but someone's got to do it and I'm one of the people that go and do it. So just support the people that go and do the frontline work. Well, and you, know, you mentioned about good dog ownership. I mean, uh, one thing uh, I've learned and I'm not you know close to it like you are, but um, you know, coming out of the pandemic there is also a real challenge for some people that took on dogs that might not be in a position to have them anymore and that sort of compounded some of the challenges for rescue spots and foster spots so anything people can do to help out certainly is um is a positive and you know helps to tackle a much bigger problem right now um here in manitoba and really around the world brady Oliveira, the bombers is with us uh Love talking about that, but have to ask you how you're feeling, how fired up you are to get back on the field on what I imagine will be a bit of an unfinished business tour for you and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers once the season kicks off. Absolutely. Uh, I'm fired up. I think that's the only word that could be used. I, I'm ready. I'm feeling really good to go. Uh, camp's right around the corner. I mean, it's it's May 12th, I think, is when we you know hit the field for the first practice. So. It's, it's right there. Um, you know, lots of guys actually are in town. So we, we got solid training groups together and we're hitting the field and we're lifting together. So um, it's been good. I can tell, you know, guys are really fired up. And, and like you said, there's there's unfinished business. Uh, you know, I I say it time and time again. I've, people have probably seen it in some articles, but, you know, um, you know, the, the season that we had last year, I think, you know, we were we were the team that should have won that great cup game. And 
at the end of the day, you know, they made a little bit more plays than us and, and you can really get beat on any given day. But, you know, with that team that we had, we were fully capable of winning that football game. But I'm glad that we got the main crew of guys back together for another year. And, and we're going to go and do some damage this year because it's definitely some unfinished business and we're all hungry for that. Have you uh, have you watched the Grey Cup back? And uh, if so, uh, how long did it take for you to get back at it? Yeah, I, I did watch the Great Cup back. Uh, I, I needed to wait a little bit. I needed I needed a couple of weeks to go by um, before I can actually sit down and, and watch it. And I actually ended up watching the replay. Um, I wasn't planning on watching it, actually. My uncle messaged me and saying, hey, the Great Cup's on TSN. They were doing a recap. And this is probably like 10 o'clock at night. I was getting ready to go to bed. So once he texted me, of course, I flipped the channel. And as soon as on TV, I was there for the rest of the night. I didn't get to bed probably till midnight after that. And my blood was boiling when I got into bed, which probably wasn't good because it kept me up a lot longer. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was good. I, I needed to watch it to kind of let go of it because now that's in the past and you can't hang on to things that are in the past. So I think after I watched it, you know, got my frustration and anger out of, of certain plays that, you know, I think personally that I could have did better in that game to help us win the football game. But um, it was good. Watch it, put it in the past, and now just keep going forward and, and just, you know, use that in the offseason to fuel you, which I've been doing. And, and, and now when the season comes along, just – I want everyone to just kind of think about that great cup game. And, and when you're feeling a little bit tired, you know, use some of that game for motivation and to keep pushing you throughout the year. Well, yeah, you know, we've spoken with, you know, a number of your teammates through the off season and they all pretty much said the same thing. It was tough to watch, but they did. And it's just going to make this team that much more focused to uh, avoid that finish, but get back to the game and, and get it done and bring the cup back to Winnipeg next year. Jim Brady, just before we go, I mean, we knew that you were going to be the, uh, the guy getting the rock for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Um, but there has been some real interesting signings, mostly re-signings. But from a guy in that offensive huddle, how uh, excited were you and the rest of the fellows to hear that Kenny Lawler is coming back to boost up that receiving core? That receiving core is nasty. Nasty. I think you look you look across the league. Obviously, we want to focus on ourselves, but I think you, know, you look at other teams and what they got on paper right now, and I think – you know, nothing comes close to what we got in that receiving room. And, and I think it's going to be good. There's going to be lots of competition, and, and competition only makes people better. So um, I'm really looking forward to camp. Camp's going to be very interesting and, and exciting. And, yeah, I mean, right now what's on paper, our starting lineup on that offense is, is going to do some, some, pretty, some pretty crazy things this, this season, and I'm really looking forward to it. Well, we're getting a lot of is it June yet's in the uh, chat right now. Cannot wait to get back to the stadium, get the snow out of here, and get you guys back on the field looking to uh, win another championship. Hey, congratulations on the Cal Murphy Award and everything you're doing in the community. It is, uh, I mean, it really is making a difference, and I think it's inspiring a lot of other people as well. And uh, listen, enjoy the last few weeks before it's time to get back to work. That's right. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, Brady. All the best. All right. Uh, there's Brady Oliveira, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, with us, uh, the recipient of the Cal Murphy Heart of a Legend Award, and uh, goes without saying that the work that he's doing in this community and in other communities around the world when it comes to dog rescue and canine ag advocacy is uh, certainly why he was a, a very great choice for that award. All right. Uh, tomorrow, I just mentioned this a little bit ago, Little Brown Jug, 7 p.m., Winnipeg Sports Talk, Sports Trivia Night. Hopefully we'll see you there. Link is tagged at the top of the chat right now. And you can also, if you're listening on the podcast, go to winnipegsportstalk.com. Just reserve your tickets to make sure you've got a spot for tomorrow night, and we will hopefully see you there. While we're there, I cannot wait to try for the first time, the new generic lager, which just launched. I mean, I love all the little brown jug beers, but I always have been more of a light beer drinker. And uh, this new one from Little Brown Jug is your basic lager, just better. Impressively standard in the best way. Light and clean to taste with a mellow flavor and a crisp finish. Now Manitoba can support local without having to move away from the domestic taste they've come to expect with a light beer. It's available in eight packs or by the can through the tap room. You can check it out tomorrow night and through vendors. It'll also be in liquor marts and will be able in single cans starting in June. Very reasonably priced at $2.99 for a single 473 milliliter and $19.99 for an eight pack. 
We'll see you tomorrow, and we'll try some of that new beer at Little Brown Jug for a Winnipeg Sports Trivia Night tomorrow. Hopefully, you can be with us. And, hey, a big shout-out to the Nick and Nikki DQ group as well. Uh, amazing support from Nick and Nikki from prior to show one of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Um, and I know they're probably our most popular customer, our sponsor when it comes to our listeners supporting because you get to go in and grab one of those delicious blizzards, an amazing stack burger and more at any of the four Nick and Nicky DQs. DQ Niverville, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, and DQ St. Anne's. If you have the opportunity to pop in and support them, we always greatly appreciate it. And you'll thank yourselves and maybe us as well because of how good the stuff is. And by the way, if you need a DQ ice cream cake or blizzard cake, you can always hit them up on Instagram at DQ Manitoba. They'll custom make it for you for a quick and easy pickup at any of the four Nick and Nicky DQs. All right, get ready for this, folks. Jeff Gustafson, the pride of Kenora, won the Bassmasters Classic, the Super Bowl of bass fishing, 300K. And uh, we're going to... Rio, do you have the video? Should we play this before we get into this? Yeah, you want to play it before uh, set the scene for uh, what it looks like? You know what? This would be great. This is... And many of you watch this on Fox Television. Um, but our guy, Gussie... Uh, was the leader after two days, had a bit of a white-knuckle ride through the third day, but ended up being the champion. And uh, here's uh, here's a little video from uh, how things looked out in Tennessee on the weekend. One of these anglers is about to become a Bassmaster Classic champion. For the first time, Gussie struggles. Just two fish today. Needs five pounds, four ounces. Six pounds, 13 ounces! Six, 13! Gussie gets it done! And oh, Canada, you have a Bassmaster Classic champion! There it is, Jeff Gustafson, the first time ever a Canadian has won this incredible award. And uh, we caught up with Gussie a little earlier on his long drive home from Tennessee back to K Town. Gussie, how the heck are you, man? Congratulations. Yeah, life's good right now for me. Um, other than we're we're driving home, we're just about to go through Chicago, and uh, uh, but yeah, it's been a crazy week. Um, and yeah, my my the highlight of my fishing career for sure happened on Sunday afternoon, and uh, you know it was uh, yeah, it was just an incredible experience. We, uh, I mean, we've talked before about uh, the fishing game, um, the pro series that you've been on, as well as just, um, you know, some great fishing info for listeners in the past when you've joined us. But, I mean, as yeah. far as things go, if, if you can, give our listeners an idea of just how big of an event this is um, and how big of a victory this is for you, who's worked so hard to get to the top of your craft. Yeah, so... Uh... I fished the Bassmaster Elite Series, and it's it's kind of like the top level of pro bass fishing. And so we have nine regular season events through you know over the course of the year. We've had two already for this season. We've got seven more to go. So we've been to Florida, uh, Georgia. We're going back to South Carolina in a few weeks. Um, and you know over the course of the year, I think we're fishing in Alabama, Texas, Michigan, New York in August. Uh, so trying to go all over the country and. Over the course of the nine events, you get points based on where you finish, and that the top there's about a hundred anglers in the field, and the top forty get to qualify for this Bassmaster Classic, and it's our big championship uh, Super Bowl event. And um, yeah, so I qualified last year, and it was my fourth time fishing the Classic, uh, and my results previously were not that good. I hadn't, you know, hadn't had a good tournament yet, and um, we went. This, this year, we went to the, the tournament was on the Tennessee River in Knoxville, Tennessee. It's always in a different place every year. And uh, I won a Bassmaster tournament two years ago at the same venue. So when the, when the schedule was announced last year, I, it put a little bit of extra pressure on me because I definitely didn't want to miss it. I wanted to be fishing in this. Um, and kind of went into it with a very similar game plan to last time with what worked last time. And... Um, yeah, it just like it worked out, and so the first two days everything went off, like perfect. I I actually caught the biggest limit each day and had almost a six pound lead going into the final. But the final day I only caught two fish, and I mean the most stressful, uh, horrible day ever 
and then it turned into the greatest day ever. When I got in, I mean, that ride home was just horrible. I thought I blew it, and I really didn't think I had a chance even. And um, it, 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 I got in, and I heard that, you know, a lot of the other guys kind of struggled too and that I was going to have a chance. And, um, and then, yeah, it, it, it ended up being very close at the end, but I caught the, got the right side of that, and we ended up, we ended up uh, making it, you know. It, it was it was crazy. What um, fill us in? I mean, so you you have that long nervous drive back in the boat. Now you you pull yeah. your fish in. You've got the two. What happens then? I mean, how are you seeing what other guys are bringing in? Is there a big scoreboard? I mean, what's the process of the nerve, the white knuckle ride you had to go through um, until you found out that you actually were the champion? And how long did all that take? Yeah, so we we uh, we had I had a cameraman in the boat with me all day. The top ten did, and they and that was you know they're making the the Fox show. Um, so they, they when you catch a fish, they'll enter a, an estimate of what the fish weighs, and usually they're going to estimate a little bit lighter than the fish actually are. Uh, so when I got in, I, I had I was leading based on the estimates, and uh, so. I, I had a chance, um, but it was stressful. Like once I got in, it was still another like two hours before I actually was able to weigh in and um, make it official. So, I mean, it was just a long time of anxiety and stress. And I called a few of my buddies. I just needed someone to talk to like my wife and my family and friends, everyone was in the arena and just waiting for the, for the show to kind of go down. And I was, I was kind of by myself in the boat and I had a few of the other anglers, you know, that I'm buddies with came and, um, you know, gave me some hugs and talked to me and, um, but yeah, it was a crazy, um, just kind of roller coaster of emotions. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was just, it was unreal how it all ended up. And then, um, probably the coolest part was like a lot of Canadians came down for the event, like people, a lot of my friends and, and some of my family and like a lot of people that I didn't even know. Uh, and in the crowd i mean there were canadian flags everywhere there was canadian flags on the bridges and the you know taken off in the morning over the river um and yeah it was then sunday night we had a pretty good party and uh you know a bunch of the everyone kind of came out and sort of partook in that and it was just uh yeah it was crazy crazy weekend and just the you know one of the best experiences of my life Jeff Gustafson is with us, the 2023 Bassmaster Classic champion, the biggest event in the sport. Um, what uh, what were the keys to winning? Um, I mean, like, what makes a successful tourney? And um, when you look back, what was the difference between you getting one over on uh, the rest of an incredibly loaded field? Yeah, so I'm fishing against the best bass anglers in the world, like literally the best in the world. And so... I, I, I've done all right. I hang in there with these guys, but I mean, it's so hard to win any of the tournaments and especially this one, there's just a lot of outside like pre- uh, pressure and just distractions. And, uh, but this tournament's a little bit different from the regular season events because there's no points on the line. Um, it's just, you know, it's kind of win or win or, I mean, you, everyone gets paid. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there's still some pretty good prize money in the top 10, but like the first place prize and that trophy are the, are the big deal. So I came there, um, you know, really with, to focus on fishing for smallmouth bass. There's largemouth and smallmouth bass here, but the smallmouth um, can average a little bit bigger size. The challenging part, they have a weird regulation at that river that you can only keep smallmouths if they're over 18 inches. And that's a pretty big fish. And so I think that sort of turned a lot of guys off to actually targeting smallmouths because he, he would catch quite a few, like 17 and a half. I mean, I caught five or six, like over 17 and three quarter inches, but not 18, like so close to the line. And I had to throw them back and like big fish um, where the large balls only had to be 14 inches to keep. So, uh, but it, yeah, and that's why I didn't catch my my limit. I had quite, I had three or four over 17 inches on the last day, but they were I wasn't able to keep them. Um, but that was the sort of the roulette game I was playing, and and it, this time it worked out. And um, yeah, it's and then I caught them all with a with a 
a four inch um, little minnow bait, a Z Man jerk shad, and I fished it on the Smeltonator jig head that my friend Brian Gustafson made. He owns Lake of the Woods Sports Headquarters. So, awesome store in Winnipeg and Kenora. And that's a bait that we use. Like every bass tournament angler in like Manitoba and Northwestern Ontario has that bait and jig head in their boat, probably. It's just a well known, really good fish catcher. Catch a lot of walleyes with it, too. But it was a bait that I had a lot of confidence in, and um, no one else in the field really, um, you know, had that much experience with with using it. I don't think. And so, yeah, it just kind of every a lot of things just sort of collided to, you know, be in my favor. And luckily, I I took advantage of it. Now, Jeff, we're showing some of the pictures and video of the. Uh the big trophy yeah. presentation and the celebration afterwards. And I was reading, they had an all time record attendance of 163,000 people for this event. I mean, are they all packing yeah. into arena to watch this? I mean, how does the, uh, how, well, how does the spectators that, work in an event like this? Yeah. So that arena was absolutely packed on the final day. Um, but they also have like a really big expo that fishing outdoors expo that goes on, um, during the event too. So like all the boat and motor and fishing tackle manufacturers, like everyone's got a, you know, at this thing. Um, but like there was, I, I don't know, six, 7,000 people at the takeoffs every morning. Like it was, it's, it's so crazy. It's such a spectacle. And, um, yeah, it's just kind of, it's the big event that everyone that loves bass fishing. And I mean, in the Southern U S that's kind of what everybody fishes for. And it's the, you know, the most popular species. So yeah, it's, it was pretty cool. Pretty crazy. Now, um, you get that big ass trophy, which, uh, you're taking back to oh, north of the border, uh, with you right now. Yeah. How was yeah. the, uh, how was the celebration afterwards? You mentioned you got your friends, your family. I saw a picture of you with your buddy, big buff who was there as well. I mean, uh, fill yeah. us in on uh, what that championship so, celebration is like after the biggest win of your life. Yeah, it was crazy. So, like, uh, Bassmaster has a tradition where they have, like, a champion's toast after, on Sunday night. So, um, got to go to that, and ever, all my friends and family did. And uh, so we were there for a few hours, and then we ended up kind of on the streets of Knoxville, and um, we were kind of all over the place, um, really. But, uh, but, yeah, Big Buff showed up. He, he – this is how – He's, he's such an awesome guy. He uh, was down in Florida with his family on a little vacation. And after Saturday, when I did well, his, uh, he got his wife to take him to the airport. He flew to Knoxville with sandals, shorts, and a T-shirt. Like, that was it. And maybe a hat. He might have had a hat. And that's what he showed up with. And, like, people were, fi- were finding him hoodies and, like, uh, but yeah, so he was there and, and was part of the party on Sunday night. And, um, you know, it was, uh, yeah, for everyone in Winnipeg, I mean, he's, he's doing good. He's, uh, yeah, living, he's, he's looking, he's living life with his kids now and fishing quite a bit and, uh, just, you know, still a awesome same guy that he was when he was playing hockey up there. Well, I know you guys don't mind putting a line in the water together and he's uh, a lot of fans still here and obviously you're fan base is growing what jeff moving forward i mean what does a win like this do for your career um i imagine it will help things like sponsorship and just the notoriety of being the first canadian champion of this event has to be a a huge huge boost for everything you've got moving forward yeah no it is it's um it's life-changing and uh you know, I, I I picked up a lot of a lot more following on social media and stuff, so that's been cool. But um, you know, as far as like, I have a lot of good sponsors, and um, it's uh, it's it gets more challenging every year to like make sure you're doing your job for everybody and keeping everybody happy. So this, I mean, this will buy me a little bit of time on you know um, not having to to maybe keep up with all the reports and and uh do the work as much um but yeah i know it's uh it's it's uh, it's crazy it's life-changing and um it'll it's gonna give me some more opportunity for sure in the in the foreseeable future you know we're just playing this video of you in the uh, in the arena getting the trophy 
with probably about yeah. a 250 pounds of ticker tape falling on your head as Enter Sandman plays. What what was that moment like, getting that trophy and seeing a packed house all looking at you, holding what everyone wanted at the beginning of the weekend? Dude, I wish I could remember it better. Um, I wish I would have, like, took it in a little better. It happened so fast, and it was so loud in there, and, like, I was just, like, I couldn't believe it. Um I yeah, if I'd had a heart rate monitor on there, it would have been probably would have broke it. Uh, but it was yeah, it was pretty 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 awesome. And um, you know, my wife Shelby got got to jump out out there too. And you know, she she travels with me to most of the tournaments, and you know, is not in the in the spotlight as much. But it's uh, she makes life a lot easier for me on the road, and um, glad that she's able to kind of come along too. But. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. Well, uh, we're looking at these pictures. It just looked like t- such an incredible moment for you, your family, and uh, everyone was there. And listen, for your community of Kenora and Lake of the Woods, I, I will imagine that uh, there might be another part of your celebration when you get back home. Fill us in on what's next for you uh, coming back home, and then um, when are you back in the boat in the, in the next event? Yeah, so yeah, I'm gonna be home, and I'm I'm supposed to go on a little ice fishing trip this weekend. So I don't know, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to make that happen still or not. But uh, but yeah, we're home for a couple of weeks, and then we actually go back to South Carolina here in mid-April, and it'll be just back back at it on the Elite Series, and um, you know, and a, a new tournament will start. And it'll just be on to the next thing, but. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna enjoy this for the next little while at home for sure, and can't wait to show the trophy to everybody. A lot, a lot of friends in Kenora and Winnipeg to to share this with, and um, and I'm sure we're gonna have a good party somewhere in Kenora. <laughs> no doubt about that. Well, listen, Jeff, uh, you know it's. And this has been so much fun. We've known you for years. You've always been so gracious with your time to fill us in on what you're doing and tell us about the sport. And uh, this is uh, this is just phenomenal. Uh, we will look forward to talking to you later on this summer, hopefully after another big win. And uh, if you can make it happen, maybe we'll finally take you up and try and see you out at Lake of the Woods, get see that trophy in person, maybe jump in the water, learn a few things from the champ. Yeah, anytime, buddy. Um, yeah, I'd love to do that. And, uh, yeah, hopefully the Jets going to get it together here or what? Well, <laughs> you know what? That's uh, This was so nice to talk about such a good news story of you winning like this because <laughs> I, I, I will tell you, there's been a lot of gnashing of teeth, but uh, we'll see what happens tonight against the Sharks and hopefully – We'll have some playoff hockey here in a couple of weeks. And uh, if you are around or make it in for that, we can certainly hook up around that as well. But Jeff, once again, congratulations. People so happy and proud um, of you and what you've done for this area and the fishing community. And uh, have a safe drive back. Have a great party when you get back to Kenora. And uh, good luck the rest of the way. And we'll catch up later on this year. Okay, thanks, man. Thanks for having me again. And uh, yeah, you guys take care. And yeah, go Jets, go. Oh, man, what an awesome conversation with a hell of a dude in Jeff Gustafson. Um, and it's, I, I know you see me angling to get out there. You know, Gussie, when I met him the first time, invited me out. And obviously the last few years with the pandemic and stuff hasn't been a great time to get together. But uh, I do plan at some point in uh, learning a little bit from the master at some point. Maybe we can get Gussie out to Aikens Lake. Really looking forward to doing that again coming up this summer but thanks to jeff gustafson follow him on twitter and instagram folks gussie outdoors i believe he's got a youtube presence as well and uh could learn a thing or two and bottom line he's done something that no canadian had ever done before winning the biggest fishing tournament in the game and uh not bad 300k richer as well as that big ass trophy that he's bringing across the border as well so big thanks to jeff gustafson and Remo, how about that buff story, by the way, before we move on to the cool bet lines? Absolutely incredible showing up with nothing, just going, <laughs> just going up from his family vacation and uh, showing up to for the party. Good thing uh, he won. Um, so, I mean, I sound like... like by a, by yeah. the way, I mean, just the fact that he was literally on a vacation with his family yeah. and like, hey, honey, take me to the airport. What, well, what's up? I'm going to Tennessee. Do you need anything? Pack a bag? Don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out when I get there. <laughs> I 
<laughs> shows up there ready to have a good time and watch his pal win the biggest trophy in the sport. Here's and yeah, here's the picture of uh, Corey Johnson, the other Canadian on, in the event, uh, tweeted out with Bufflin, with uh, Jeff and the trophy. Um, pretty incredible story. His wife must be uh, amazing wife to be like, yeah, 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 you can go and party in Knoxville. It's, it's no problem. <laughs> so, what what a story that was. Oh, man. Uh, anyways, uh, we'll get some great feedback. We'll probably post that up separately on the channel tomorrow for maybe people that want to learn more about the Bassmaster Classic champion, Kenora's Jeff Gustafson. Uh, all right, well, man, this has been a wild show. We're uh, past three already. Let's get to the cool bet lines for tonight and see what we've got in the National Hockey League. Busy, busy night. Tampa at Carolina. That's a hell of a matchup. Carolina minus 131 favorites. After uh, losing in, uh, was it a shootout to Boston on Sunday? Uh, the Bruins are back at home, taking on the Predators. Boston, a big minus 309 favorite. Carolina, by the way, minus 131 Moneyland faves at home against the Lightning. Penguins need to beat the Detroit Red Wings and take advantage of Florida's fourth straight loss last night, losing to the Ottawa Senators. They can uh, move five up on the uh, pit, on the uh, Panthers if they uh, can get a win tonight. They're minus 188 road favorites in Detroit. Rangers are a huge minus 385 favorite against the Columbus Blue Jackets. Patrick Laine out to at least April 8th. The Flyers and Habs playing in Philly, where Dave Poon will be doing the game. Minus 169 on Philly. Pick them between the Canucks and Blues. I think I'm going to lean in Canucks for my daily pick for Cool Bet Canada. We'll hit that up on the Cool Bet socials a little later on. Vancouver's won 8 of 10 and 5 of their last 6. Blues gave up 7 on the weekend to the Kings and... Uh, Bennington's back in. You know you can't count on him this year, although watch that. Watch him get a shutout and uh, blow my bet. Uh, Dallas is in Chicago to take on the Blackhawks. Dallas a minus 288 favorite. Huge game in the Western race. LA Kings at Calgary Flames. Calgary's minus 128. LA is plus 109 on the money line. Oilers in Vegas. Oilers. Oilers, a road favorite. Interesting. Uh, minus 125 for Edmonton against Vegas at plus 106. And then the game that we'll all be watching, 9.30 p.m. tonight, the final game on the slate. Jets, minus 194 road favorites. Sharks, plus 163. But listen, I've seen a lot of talk in the chat. Ezzy Ginsburg, by the way, has dropped a Ginsburg guarantee that Mark Scheifele is going to score not once but twice tonight. If you want to ride the Ginsburg guarantee, nine to one on Mark Shifley over one and a half goals tonight. As far as just scoring, period, Shifley's plus 174. Kyle Connor is plus 161. Dubois plus 175. Nikolai Ehlers plus 215. Adam Lowry plus 370, and uh, I might even touch on Lowry. As I said, I really think that he'll be engaged and be in and around the front of the net. They're going to look to get a lot of Ehlers shots on goal, and that might benefit Lowry and Mason Appleton, who's a very nice plus 420. Of course, all the props options are there for you when you click on the game at CoolBet, but uh, the entire slate is up right now. Check out today's lock shop for you baseball fans. Dusty and I gave out our favorite Major League Baseball future bets for the upcoming season, opening day, Thursday. And we will talk a little Jays in the next couple days before they get going on the weekend. Well, on Thursday, heading in for the first weekend of Major League Baseball. Uh, Pack show, Remo. Lots of fun today. Great to have Brady on and so much fun to have Gussie in addition to our great Jets talk with Pooley and Mike McIntyre. And uh, obviously... A little bit of extra time for people to check out the show if they didn't catch it live today because we got a 9.30 p.m. start this evening. Yeah, it was great to have some uh, positive stories at the end with Brady and, <laughs> Brady and um, sorry, and uh, Jeff Gustafson um, rather than talking about the Jets' second half. So, that, I mean, that was great stories as, you know, great story from Jeff from winning tournament Brady with his uh, dog rescue, getting the Cal Murphy Award. Um, so nice, nice balanced uh, show here, and we, I'm looking forward to staying up late here, 9.30 start time tonight, but also a number of games, as you said, and we'll also be watching. I'll probably have to, the Calgary-LA game. LA, road favorite. I think they're, I saw a mall rating in chat. They're, what, 10-0-2? Oh, 
in their last 12 games. Oh, uh, man, the they've been steamrolling everybody. I mean, mm-hmm. as disappointing as that game on Saturday was from a Jet standpoint, they're certainly not the only team that's gotten worked by L.A., and they seem to be getting ready to make a real run at the uh, at the West once we get to get to playoff time tonight. So um, coming back tomorrow, what are we, is Marat jumping on tomorrow or is he Thursday? Marat's tomorrow. He's going to be he's driving back from San Jose to L.A. tomorrow. So he'll be joining. We'll do a record with him in the morning before he drives. Scott Billick will join us, uh, recap the game, and also uh, we'll chat Winnipeg Ice. Uh, you know, their season's wrapped up and they're looking towards the playoffs now. Yeah, exactly. And I'm uh, hoping to get my pal J.D. Bunkus from Sportsnet on to uh, tee up the Blue Jays season as well. Uh, but yeah, hoping to have Ben Zlotti from the ice on tomorrow. Don't forget, ice playoffs begin on Friday against Medicine Hat. Check out the ice website. They do have a pay-as-you-go playoff option, which I think you have until tomorrow to opt in for um, if you want to follow the ice all the way through what could be a very fun and long playoff race. And uh, we'll have Munzee tee up uh, the game on Friday as well, coming up on uh, coming up on the program. Before we go, uh, it's your boy Bruce is asking us for the Chief Saholic update. Um, okay. Have you seen this? Because P- I know we're about to uh, yeah. about to leave, but we've mentioned this on the show before. At the end, this Chief super fan who is accused of robbing a bank in Oklahoma. He's now on the run from the law with a million dollar bond out for his arrest. Uh, and uh, and keep in mind, when he left, he petitioned the court to get out early because he had a family vacation, which happened to be in Arizona the week of the Super Bowl. <laughs> and with some of the money that presumably he got from robbing banks, he made a couple of massive wagers on Mahomes to win the MVP and the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl. So... <laughs> He's uh he's gotten paid, that's for sure. But yes, I am seeing updates online that are coming in that the Chief Superman, who was arrested for robbing a bank while on the way to the Texans game, cut his ankle monitor off and is on the run. So if you see a Chiefs fan in a wolf's costume and you're near a bank, go the other way. But you can't congratulate him on a great season. Removes the <laughs> ankle monitor? That's... That's not helping stuff. I don't know. This seems like it's going to end badly for him. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. when he finally gets caught, it'll be a couple of extra years. But maybe no. he just wanted to go and really, really enjoy the Super Bowl win. He'll, de- he'll deal with all that later. <laughs> Chiefsaholic. We'll, we'll see if we can get more Chiefsaholic updates as we get into the, uh, into the weekend. Uh, of course, big news in the NFL from yesterday. Lamar Jackson has requested a trade. I, I still don't understand how this is going. I mean, teams could sign Lamar right now for two first round picks as compensation. Obviously, you got to get that deal done too. It's a fascinating standoff right now between Lamar, the Ravens, and really the rest of the National Football League because I'm not sure any team wants to grant Lamar what he wants. And that's the fully guaranteed contract like the Bozo Browns gave Deshaun Watson. Um, but we'll touch on this as we get closer to the weekend. Tomorrow, full recap on tonight's game with the Jets and the San Jose Sharks. We'll get ready for ice playoffs and much more. Join us then. Thanks to Jeff Gustafson, the boss of Bass, Bassmaster champion, Brady Oliveira, the uh, Murphy Award winner, heart of a legend for Brady Oliveira from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And of course, Mike McIntyre and our pal Dave Poulin. Um, keep an eye on our socials. Maybe we'll tweet out that goal from Pooley, but we'll definitely put out a little clip of how Dustin Bufflin ended up at the Bassmasters Championship on Sunday, courtesy of Jeff Gustafson himself. Um, but yeah, get a nap in if you need. 9.30 puck drop tonight. And big games around the National Hockey League, including that L.A. Calgary game, which we'll be keeping an eye on. We'll break it all down tomorrow on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Thanks for being with us. Tell a friend about WST, and don't forget to plan to join us tomorrow at Little Brown Jug. Hope to see you there for our sports trivia night. Link in the description and at winnipegsportstalk.com. Have a great night, everyone. Oh, my God. Shut it down. Let's go home. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. 
Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.